I was down over $50,000 on my lifetime mm. account. And I was like, I'm now at zero, right? I'm now starting from zero profit, zero loss. If there was one piece of advice that I would have to someone who's trying to learn and is going through and follow it and is on social media, it would just be... Welcome everyone to the Words of Wisdom podcast. We are back once again for our final podcast in Miami. And we saved the best till last. We're joined by Jake, a.k.a. Rake Trades. My man, thank you so much for having me, truly. It is uh, very, very special to be here. It's my pleasure, man. I know we've been, uh, we don't really know each other like too well, but we, we've been speaking for a well, couple months. A couple maybe. months now, yeah, yeah. We've been trying to get the timing right, trying to plan something. Yeah. I mean, I saw you... And your dude, your podcast growth has been unreal. And seriously, it's something that you like deserve to, some a serious credit for because uh, there are not many people who I would like drop everything. Be like, I need a twenty four hour trip. We got to go film. I got to do it. But for you to come out here and do this, I feel very, very grateful. So yeah, man, it's been an inspiration to watch you. I appreciate it, man. And I was saying the same exact thing to you. Like the energy is real, and the, and the the level of detail. You know that a lot of people we were discussing that right. Yes, that absolutely. A lot of people don't have that level of detail, that dedication, mm -hmm. that consistency. Um, but before we skip over too much, um, yeah, there'll be a lot of people out there who might not know who you are. Yes. So therefore, this is our opportunity to go into sort of how you got to where you are today. So be as brief or as long as you want. No problem at all, because we have the time. <laughs> um, you should have seen at the, uh, at the summit, I was like, T very, very briefly. Yeah. <laughs> Within 60 seconds, tell me about your whole life story very quickly. <laughs> but uh, yeah, be as brief or as long as you want. Uh, and basically just how you got to where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. So I am a futures and options day trader. So a little bit outside of your niche of Forex, which I'm actually really excited about. I think that there's some elements of what I've learned in stock trading that haven't made their way to the Forex world yet. Mm -hmm. And a chart is a chart, right? So no matter what we talk about today, no matter who the audience is, I think it's going to be in an insane value. And mm -hmm. I, uh, I definitely want to make sure to go out of my way to bring that energy. Um, but yeah, my name is Jake. I have been day trading for coming up on six years now. So mm -hmm. it's been a journey for me. I found out about trading during my last half of my like college career. Okay. So I actually already had a job lined up. I studied plant science, absolutely nothing to do with <laughs> trading. Um, and during my last two years of college, I found out about trading. And on Instagram, I saw someone post a Robin Hood screenshot. They mm. were up like 100 bucks in a day or something like that. And I was like, I would like to be up 100 bucks in a day. Like, mm. that sounds really nice. Like, mm. what, what can I do to make $100 in a day? And uh, I found out about trading through social media, and it ultimately kind of led me down this path of finding a few different mentors, trying stock trading at first. Mm -hmm. I tried trading penny stocks, and then pretty quickly moved over into the options world, mm -hmm. got destroyed, <laughs> and pretty quickly moved back to stocks, then tried futures, tried pretty much all of the various asset classes outside of Forex. It's mm -hmm. the one that I haven't made my way to yet. Um, and after a whole lot of trial and error of the first, like, I'd say two years before I even like found a remote sense of consistency, mm -hmm. right? Like the first two years for me, I always, I'm very open about this. I was just burning money. I was just down, 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 down. And I didn't really know what I was doing, nor did I put in the effort to, mm -hmm. to actually try and make any progress. For me, it felt like it was like two years of, of just trying to get more dopamine hits, AKA entering a trade yeah. and hoping it works. Right. So after a long period of, uh, not being successful at trading and many, many blown accounts, many, many deposited paychecks that ultimately went to zero, I decided to take it a little bit more seriously. I think that I had a conversation with my parents and my dad was sort of like, hey, like if this is, I, I'm supportive of you giving this whole thing a shot, but you got to make start making some progress. Like it, right now, from what you've told me, you've gone pretty much nowhere and you're just losing all of the money that you've saved up throughout these jobs and college internships and all that. And you're like, this is not real progress. If you're going to do this, you have to make some sort of progress for mm -hmm. it, right? Through that, was able to find a few different mentors that really put me in the position uh, to succeed. And from there, finally found some consistency, trading mostly futures and options. Mm -hmm. So futures and options, and mainly options, are now what I trade on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that kind of, it all started through social media, right? Which is why now I'm like so passionate and have this energy about it. Is mm -hmm. One person on social media changed my life forever six years ago. Yeah. And if one sort of piece of energy or podcast that we can do can do that for someone else, then that in and of itself makes everything worth it, right? Um, so yeah, it's been a long journey coming up on six years now, but now I've finally started to find my rhythm a little bit uh, in what I'm doing. That's in incredible to hear. Absolutely incredible to hear. And you know, when you were going through that process of, of the losses, for example, mm -hmm. um, you know, what, 
what were the key things that were the issues of causing those losses? Yeah, yeah. I So I always tell this to people that I believe I had some of the worst habits of all time, right? Mm-hmm. So like, it's really interesting now to see where I'm at and the success I've been able to have considering when I started, it was like everything you like read about on Reddit, that's mm-hmm. like the terrible things people would do, like I would be doing those things. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of it for me came from, I wasn't trying to, and I imagine this is similar in the Forex world, it wasn't trying to grow, I was trying to flip, right? Mm-hmm. I wanted to flip, yeah. I wanted to flip. I wanted to take my $2,000 account and turn it into five. And then once I had five, I was like, then I'll start being safe, right? <laughs> yeah. I, and that's the way it all, it's the mindset that it always goes mm-hmm. for. And so for me, it was really just, nonstop inconsistency. So there was points in times, and I've talked about this a little bit in the past, but there was points in times where I would get a paycheck on Friday Mm -hmm. and I would deposit that paycheck into my account on Friday. And then by like the next Wednesday, it would probably be gone, right? And Mm -hmm. and, um, that happened for, you know, several months straight, I feel like, where I just wasn't able to, the whole goal of what I was trying to do is I wanted to make back the money I had lost, right? I wanted to make back what I had started. And I was like, as soon as I get there, I'm going to, I'll be, I'll start acting right, right? I'll mm-hmm. start trading, using risk management. I'll start doing all these things, but I just need to get back to break even. I just need to get back to what I started with. I just need to do that. And that's, as we all know, that's the worst way to trade, right? Yeah. Then you're making it all about the dollars, all about the process. So for me, not only was my mindset wrong, but then I also just, I was approaching it the complete wrong way in terms of how much I was willing to risk, right? Mm -hmm. In my eyes, I was just trying to flip everything as quick as I could to get back to a break-even point or even remotely close to a break-even point. And it wasn't until I completely stopped that and doing that that I made any sort of forward progress, Mm -hmm. right? And then I actually, it took, it was a long journey from there, but every single one of the bigger losses that I had stemmed from trying to make back the initial losses, mm-hmm. right? That every trader goes through in the beginning. Rather than accepting that I lost that money, mm-hmm. I was hyper fixated on how can I make that exact amount back? Then I'm break even, then I'll be good, right? Like that, I feel like that's such a trap mindset of as soon as I'm at X, I'll be good. As yeah. soon as I'm at X, I'll be good. Whether it's on a challenge account or whether it's on your own personal funded account, it's the kind of thing where we, you know, we set like if then conditions mm-hmm. almost on some level and it's like, if I get to break even or if I get to XXX, then I'm going to use risk management. Then I'm going to be disciplined. Yeah. Then I'm going to be all that. And that just led me down a deep, deep hole of just depositing, losing, depositing, losing, depositing, mm-hmm. losing. Was there anything in particular that helped you to kind of get out of that mindset though? Um, I would say that conversation with my dad, the one where he told me essentially, he's like, hey man, I, I love you and I'm going to support you no matter what you do. I have an amazing relationship with my parents and... Um, I think I'm going to support you no matter what you do. Not financially, but he's like, I'm going to support you because he's definitely, he's like, no, I'm not financially. <laughs> he's like, but like, I'm, I'm your dad. I'm always going to be that. I'm always going to be in your corner. I'm always going to be rooting for you. He's like, but mm. you've been at this for a couple of years. You really haven't made any progress. Like something's got to change, mm-hmm. right? Because I was very open with him about the struggles and everything that I was going through. So I think that conversation with him, one of the things that he helped me do is he was like, you need, we came to that conclusion that I needed to forget about everything that had happened, right? I needed to have a blank slate. I needed mm-hmm. to be starting trading from a blank slate. And I describe this as like, you're just the stages one through 10 of a trader. This for me is like stage six. After you've blown, taking that big blown account, big mm-hmm. loss, you come back with a blank slate. And for me, one of the things that really helped as simple as it sounds was I changed brokers. So previously mm-hmm. I was using a broker that when you click your all time year to date, I would see how much I was down, right? I was down over $50,000 on my lifetime Mm. account. And I was like, and so every time you would even have a good day, it would still be feeling like you're chipping away at that negative year to date, right? And it's like, and what that will always lead you to do at some point in time is take too big of a risk to try and erase that, Mm. right? So switching brokers was not only a great decision for me just because I moved away from a bad broker into one that was actually a very reputable, high quality broker, but it also got my P and L from the, like it would lifetime. I considered it gone, right? Mm-hmm. Like obviously I knew I'd lost that money. Fortunately in my tax returns, that was something that would ultimately come back and kind of help me after. Yeah. Um, but I got a new fresh broker, fresh account. I was like, okay, I'm now at zero, right? I'm now starting from zero profit, zero loss. And now I can really give this a fresh try, a fresh try with like a blank slate. Mm-hmm. And that for me, was huge. That was really, as much as it sounds simple, it's those little mental things that can really make all of the difference in Mm -hmm. your trading. It really is. It really is. And, you know, it's it's really crazy that you say in terms of like the 50,000 loss. Yeah. How old were you at the time? I was uh, 20, 21, 22. Yeah. 
which was so for reference, people have always asked me, how did you have 50,000? I worked like every summer for all of my high school and for the first few years of my college internships. I just saved it. I was pretty good at saving. I didn't have, I had living expenses in college, but I don't know. I wasn't bad with money. I was good with, <laughs> until I started to learn trading, I was actually good with <laughs> money, right? Like, so I had saved that up throughout the course of like three, four years of working summer in high school and then two and a half years of working internships in mm -hmm. college. So it's not that crazy of a number to think that like over many years I mm. saved that up, right? Then but yeah, and then it was... It's crazy to think about losing it though. Yes, at that age. yes. Yeah. How, how, what was that like? Obviously, we already talked about, you know, the mindset of yeah. having to try and make it back. But what was it actually like you know, feeling that loss, you know, and realizing that loss? It was very brutal. I um, The one thing about me though is that as much as it was like hard and it was a setback in that moment, people always ask me, did I ever think about quitting, mm. right? Did you ever think about quitting or giving up and all this? I personally, it never even crossed my mind because I had seen people be successful at this, whether it was someone like Umar Ashraf, who's someone I've always, he just was the first person in my space or my mm -hmm. very first mentor, Stock Market Wolf. Like I had seen people were successful at this. So for me, I didn't, I wasn't like considering quitting, but I, there were some points in times where it was just really low nights, right? Mm -hmm. Like for me personally, it was, the way that I would cope with that was not healthy, but I would just be staying in on a Friday night, just watching TV, just sitting there in my room, smoking joints, just doing nothing, right? And being like, then I'm a, I, 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 I know I'm gonna get there one day, but this part of it sucks, mm -hmm. right? Like this part is really brutal. This part is not so fun. And it took a toll on me. There was a point in time where after I came back from that, mm -hmm. after I kind of, or, or not even like grew from that, but after I tried to, that blank slate, where I ended up cutting out unintentionally a lot of my friends from high school, from relationships that I built, just because I was like, all right, now that I've gone through and I've felt that very low low of losing 50, all of the savings, losing everything, now I'm going into like work mode and mm -hmm. it's just work, work, study, study charts on them all night. So I never thought about quitting, but those lows helped push me to where I'm at now because I never wanted to get back there. Mm -hmm. I never wanted to feel that feeling again because I didn't even have. Sometimes with trading, you have like those lows, but you also have some good highs that you can like, be like, oh, it's yeah. it's a balance of both. I had only lows those first two years. It yeah. was just straight losing. So it was one of the harder moments of my life in general, I would say, is to try and understand what I had done to get myself to that point and mm -hmm. then trying to fathom how could I ever recover from it was a very hard, very low point. Definitely. No, I can only imagine. And was it was there a particular reason for the losses? Was it lack of... You know, technicals, uh, ability and technical understanding, obviously lack, uh, lack of discipline or psychology, risk management. Every, everything you just named. <laughs> everything you just named. So I, I started off by using a very indicator-based technical system. Mm. And I don't think I ever really fully understood how that worked. And I was trying to use a strategy that I didn't even really know how to use, mm -hmm. right? And then I think it was a combination of that plus a lack of risk management, plus all the traditional psychology errors that traders make. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, what what it was about me that like let it go on for that long, right? Of two years of not making any real changes mm -hmm. in my trading. And I made minor changes. I tried different strategies. That's one thing I will say. I was hot strategy hopping at the time, right? Mm -hmm. Going from learning this to learning RSI to moving average crossovers to all these basic indicators, strategies hopping. Mm -hmm. So, but I didn't have any real foundational knowledge of chart structure and how charts actually moved. Mm -hmm. So that combined with every risk management, every psychology error in the book that you hear beginners making, it was almost just like a cascading, you know, it was everything all at once, mm -hmm. right? And just being, it, yeah, not, it was not a good, it was a combination of everything bad, pretty much. D did you actually in that time read any books, you know, in that case? I started books in that time. It was yeah, in that time I started books, never finished them. Mm. Right. So it was one that there was one that I finished that was a very basic technical analysis book. But I was in that mode where I'd even like b purchased courses. I watched the first lesson of them and then I didn't finish them. Yeah. Right. Which by the way, for recorded courses, that's a very high number statistically speaking. A lot of people buy the courses, then don't end up finishing them. Right. And I fell into that category where I didn't even make it past the first two lessons because you see a couple of things and then all of a sudden in your head, you're like, that's all I needed. I'm good. I don't yeah. need the rest, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I was reading a book here and there. I hadn't read any trading psychology books up until that point. Mm -hmm. So no trading in the zone, no mental, none of even the basic ones. So for me, that trading psychology was something that was just completely beyond me, right? It was mm -hmm. just way over my head. Um, so I had had 
from the beginning, I had had like a technical, somebody who's trying to teach me a technical system. So it wasn't like I was just doing random things. Like I, I think, I think at least that my <laughs> trades had some sort of idea that I was hoping yeah. to happen. Um, but it was just, I think really what it comes down to is trading, no matter what form you're doing it in, no matter what you're trading, and no matter how experienced that you are in trading, mm -hmm. no matter what, as soon as you enter a permit position, there's this little rush of dopamine, and all of a sudden it's like, I have money on the line now. Yeah. I, have a, I have a trade, and it feels good. It mm -hmm. feels like we all sort of like that rush of like, I'm in a position I have risk on now, like, let's go. Like it, it, There's that sort of element, and I think in the beginning of those first two years, that's all I was seeking. Mm -hmm. I think that I wasn't really trading, right? I wasn't trading... I wasn't trying to make money. I wasn't trying, because even when I had profits, I wouldn't take them. I wasn't trying to follow a system. I wasn't trying to analyze or be calculated in what I was doing. The only thing that I was doing was searching for hits of dopamine, right? It was almost like, it, was like, it sounds like an addict, right? Searching for something, which at one point, I think, I'd mentioned I had a conversation with my dad, but I also had a conversation with my mom. And it was right after I had taken a bigger loss and I remember going down and talking to my mom about it. And I was like, don't worry, mom, I'm going to deposit a little bit more tomorrow. I'm going to make up for it. Like I just, and she looked at me and she was just like, this, you realize this sounds like a gambler, a gambling addiction, right? And I was just like, no, 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 no. This is trading. This is not like, I've heard trading is gambling, but it's different, right? It's different. But I think truly those first two years, I think that conversation, the one I had with my dad really stuck with me because now it's all of a sudden I'm like, okay, I was gambling. I was just searching for a little hit of dopamine. Uh -huh. Once I got that, I was like, I don't care. I'll figure out how I'll get the next one later, mm -hmm. right? And so it almost felt like I was addicted to addicted to trying to trade or addicted to that dopamine hit without actually, find, without actually having any concrete mm. plan, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, which that was a, a not fun time for sure. No, I can imagine. And uh, what were the key things that then you implemented to change those times? Then? Definitely. So those conversations with my parents helped me put a new mindset in place. But that, a new mindset doesn't do anything unless you actually make changes on mm -hmm. that, right? Unless you actually start to enact physical changes. So I had a few different things. I learned from a few various different mentors. There's three that I always like to give like a firm shout out to. One is his name, who's not on social media, is a guy named Kansas City Shuffle. Hard to find out there, but he helped me a lot. I have uh, a mentor named Eric from Major League Trading mm. and an author, Al Brooks, who wrote the book Reading Price Charts Bar by Bar, which you and I spoke a little bit before. This mm. is the book that I don't think has made it to the Forex world, at least to my knowledge yet. Mm -hmm. And that book <laughs> changed the way on how I was trading. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, it was to go back to your original question of how did I get out of that? Those conversations with my parents were kind of the start, right? Mm -hmm. That pushed me into, okay, something's got to change. Then from there, it was, okay, let me find some sort of strategy that actually works, right? Yeah. I need something that's concrete, gives me structure, gives me rules. And by finding these various mentors, I was able to actually put those all a little bit more in place, mm -hmm. right? Um, and really, I would say that the book, Reading Price Charts Bar by Bar, that one just changed the way that I viewed charts as a whole, right? After reading that book, which it's a very hard read, it is one of the driest books he is a that's older. Why, that's why it hasn't made it over. <laughs> that's why it hasn't made it over. It's one of the driest books. It is. It is. He is an older gentleman who's been trading futures, the S and P, right? So equivalent to trading SPX five hundred. Yeah. He's been trading those for years, and essentially his thesis on his book is that candles and individual bars have been around for so long that if you actually know how to read each one of them, you can then tell the story on what's going to happen in the chart. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, I was like, okay, a chart makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Like this wasn't my breakthrough to consistent profitability or to scaling. But after that, I was like, oh my gosh, like these make sense. It's not random, right? It's not like, oh, this is, I don't know why this is happening. There's actually a structure in place for, okay, we have a lower high here. We're going to take out that swing low. There's actually these chart things that you can start to recognize that really make sense. Mm. So I think my first break out of that, the bad two years, was finding that and being allowing myself to say, okay, hey, here's a strategy that you can start to understand charts that really, that you get. It mm. like actually works. It's not something where I'm feeling like there's guesswork. It's not something where I feel like it's open to interpretation, right? Yeah. Which I felt like some of my other mentors kind of give you strategies that are like open to interpretation it's like oh when it works for you pick what that works best for you and i'm like yeah. no i need i need structure and so that book gave me a whole whole lot of structure and it's always the thing that i mention on any time that i'm doing any sort of content is that the best free way to learn trading the best free resource out there that you can have in my opinion for understanding how charts move is to study that book there's pdfs of it online so you don't even have to purchase it out of respect for the writer i would but um <laughs> 
you then what he would do is he went goes through a lot of five minute charts and various time frame charts. Mm -hmm. And he breaks down each individual candle, what's happening. He goes, okay, this candle did this. This candle did that. And I, what I would do is I would print out 50, 20, 30 different charts for individual days. And I would go through all of them. I'd start marking them up, trying to mark like him. And for the first time, I felt like, okay, I actually know what's happening in a chart to a small degree, right? Yeah. Maybe not to a full extent that I know now. But that made a monumental difference for me. It really gave me structure, right? And I think structure as a trader is, a necess is absolutely necessary. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. And you know, it's interesting to, see, to hear obviously the different sources. So that was a book, of course. The, but the, were the other ones like uh, sort of mentorships and and sort of uh, not in person, but more personal connection and, and personal communication. The skilled challenge is finally here. Enjoy the lowest profit targets in the industry through our skilled challenge, which is only requiring a six percent profit target. Yes, you heard that right. Not only that but enjoy 85% profit split as well as a 125% challenge free refund, all part of the best product on the market. You get to choose your drawdown between eight or 10% for our toggle option. So you choose how much drawdown you'd like. Take advantage of the skill challenge today. Yes. So the other two are more personal communications for the longest time from like 20, 18 to 2020, I'd worked with a guy named Kansas City Shuffle, mm -hmm. who I believe he taught me, we, we didn't work, it was all on Discord, right? But he, I believe he taught me not necessarily any one strategic point that I used, but he was almost just like the guy who really taught me the ins and outs of the markets, things that you should pay attention to, mm -hmm. right? Like little details, little, the nitty gritty of stuff that was going on. Mm -hmm. And then I found Eric from Major League Trading who helped me identify, okay, here is a level system that you know that I know works, and I really then took that, made it my own, and I've, it's the most accurate level system that I've that I've ever used mm -hmm. in my life. And I, um, it's a it it has some correlation to order blocks, I think. Mm. So it's, it, it um, definitely relates in the FX world as well, right? Yeah. Um, but after finding those two, so I had uh, Al Brooks was more of the book. I never talked to him, never did that. And then having the other two that I was actually able to reach out to mm. and connect with them, and I. I didn't bug them because I figured out the right way to ask questions. Mm -hmm. But this is also another life hack if you have a mentor. If you can show them that you can provide value to them, right? Mm -hmm. If you can show them that you can provide value, and really if you can show them that you're asking good questions, mm -hmm. they're way more receptive to giving you information and helping you and helping you learn in a deep way. Like I, I remember seeing various students ask you know, um, a question that would be, why are we doing this? They'd just be like, why, why am I buying... Why am I going long here? Mm -hmm. That would be the question. And I'm like, okay, that's if you if you ask a question that way, the answer you're going to get is most likely that person who's like, I don't really want to, I don't know. It seems like you're not putting any effort in. Yeah, right. Yeah. So instead I would go out of my way to be like, hey, I'm looking at X, Y, Z, Z, and Z. There's mm -hmm. B, B, A, and D. All of these things line together. I'm looking to do this. What would you think of that? Right. And I would ask very intuitive, very good questions. And from there, I was able to build some really good relationships with a lot of fellow creators out there or just educators and mentors. And that'll put me in a position to where I had really personal relationships with these people. And it helped me a lot as a trader, for sure. And definitely, definitely. I can only imagine. But I think it's a very powerful point there that you said in regards to the quality of questions. Yes. You know, because I'm sure you have it all the time. I have it all the time as well. Where it's just, I get the one where it's like, hi, can I ask you a question? Yeah. It's like, why, why waste the time? Why waste the time to ask me if you can yeah. ask me a question? Yeah, just, yeah. Just, just go straight in. Even then, there'll be like the most basic of questions where it just shows a lack of uh, sometimes intelligence, but also just being lazy. Yeah. You know? And I think that I was speaking about this earlier today. It almost, you can tell as an educator, mm. typically speaking, within the first hour of conversation with a student, you can tell roughly, at least in the beginning, I feel like I can tell if how long it's going to take them to succeed, right, in trading, because everyone's, maybe not how long, everyone's going to be different on the exact timeline, but you can tell based on the questions someone asking, is this a person that is going to put in the work, going to put in the effort, going to try and do that, because no matter who your educator is, there is no perfect system. Mm -hmm. Trades are going to fail. That's the way charts move. Things go from uptrends to downtrends. In order to do that, setups have to fail, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's never going to be a picture-perfect strategy out there, but if you have a student that is asking good questions, asking the right things, isn't asking, isn't trying to figure out, can I hold this or that? It's more actually genuinely inquiring and mm -hmm. showing you that you put in that effort. You can tell that they're going to do well, but it also makes you want to help them more. Mm -hmm. At least because you see you're like, 
okay, you took 20 minutes out of your day to write up and you also took 20 minutes to write up in a way that makes it easy for me to answer, yeah. I'm going to go out of my way to give you a solid answer in return, right? I'm going to go out of my way to make sure that I'm covering every detail of what you asked mm -hmm. because I can tell you went out of your way to make it easy for me, right? Like, yeah. I truly think that if there's any hack that you can have to in order to have a better relationship with the mentor that you have, mm -hmm. in the questions that you ask, make sure, is this something I can Google? If it is, I'm not asking my mentor it, right? If it's a Googleable question, that's, uh, and again, that might vary on the specific topics, but if it's something that's generally, or like times, you know, basic broker questions, those kind of yeah. things, those things can be avoided, right? When they're the questions that, hey, you know, I, this setup looked really good and it failed. Was this something that just failed or was there an error in my thinking? Mm -hmm. That's, those are the type of questions that you bring to your mentor and those allow you to develop that really close personal relationship. Every mentor that I have had, and I've had seven or eight of them in various different capacities, whether it be trading, whether it be entrepreneurship, whether it be content creation, every single one of them that I have, I have an amazing relationship with, even though at some points of those, I kind of like broke off from them. And in theory, sh we shouldn't be close anymore, right? Like there's, mm. there's people that I've worked with before that when I left, I was working for them. And then when I left, people followed me, right? And I took away cuss, like all that kind of stuff. We, in theory, shouldn't have a good relationship. Yeah. But if you build that bond and you ask these people the right questions, then your relationship becomes above all else, it becomes all above any type of business. It becomes mm -hmm. any type of above anything else. And really, it all starts with how much effort are you putting in when you're asking your mentor a question? Definitely. And where did that mindset stem from, though? Is that something, a you know, thought process you've always had, or is it something you picked up or learned from? I think that it came, I mentioned I had a great relationship with my dad. My dad uh, and my mom, have. I have to give them both amazing credit on this. They've both been really good communicators. Mm. And as weird as this might sound, I actually, I've never thought about it this way until you just mentioned it. But when I was younger, when I was like 13, 14, I had a sister who was two years older than me. I would watch her just argue with my parents all the time. So they would just get into fights. You know, teenage, nothing crazy, but teenage rebellious. You yeah. know, I want to go out. No, you can't go out. All these kinds of things. With, their, with my parents, and I'd be sitting back there as the younger child just kind of watching and learning. And I'd mm -hmm. be like, okay, when Annie wants to go out, my sister, when she wants to go out to a party and my parents say no, this is usually how the conversation goes. She yeah. says something like this, mm -hmm. they respond like this, this is how she gets, and then they end up getting in a fight. So I kind of learned, I was like, okay, if I can make sure to ask my mom and dad the right, which sounds so crazy to think that this is the analogy, but it's like, if yeah. I can ask my mom and dad the right way to let me go to this party, maybe they'll let me go to the party and we'll be on good terms afterwards. Mm. And I almost think that that is where it kind of came from for me is that I learned by watching my sister do it the wrong way, mm -hmm. right? And then I started to be like, okay, here's how I can change what she did in order to get a better outcome, mm -hmm. right? And I think that very much came to roll as soon as I was in the Discord world and in the learning world of trading, I started to see that, okay, when I see someone ask a question like, why are we long on SPX right now, mm -hmm. right? They didn't get a very good answer, right? And I started to see that. I started to see that the creators or mentors that were answering those questions would kind of be like, ah, like ignore them or give them a less better response. And I saw that I was like, okay, well, hey, if I phrase this question a little bit differently, much like I phrased it differently than my sister did trying to go to a party back yeah. in the day, if I can phrase this differently and communicate a little bit better, then I can get a much better result, mm -hmm. right? And I think that that for me is where like the level of detail and specific nuances of how you communicate, mm -hmm. I think can absolutely change your life, right? The way you ask a question, the tone that you use, all of these little things can absolutely change your life because one good relationship that comes out of the way that you acted and the way that you spoke can set you up for generations, right? Yeah. So for me, I think that watching my sister kind of fail a little bit at the way she did that mm -hmm. led me to be like, okay, now I know the right way to ask. No, definitely, definitely. It makes sense. And it's, it's interesting that you're able to observe that uh, and have those sort of thoughts at that age as well. Yeah. Because you know, most people have that sort of perception or at least that understanding of perception to be able to to be aware of that. But it's incredible. And I think a lot of people could hopefully take note from that and hopefully we'll start to get yes. some, some higher quality questions as well. But I think it's important just generally as well, um, you know, not just to be surface level, you know, do the basics, do the... Because mm. again, with like a lot of people's mindset coming into trading is that they want to obviously be financially free and have this freedom in their life, which trading can provide. But you have to be willing to put in effort, actual effort. So if you're then not putting effort in even just basic responses or just with you trying to ask a question, where's you know, where's the translation or the, the reflection of that going to be? You know, you're not going to, no effort here in just the basics outside, trying to, you're no lack of effort to try and improve your trading. Yep. 
will only probably uh, result in a lack of results in your trading. A hundred percent. One way that I like to think about it is that trading can be a shortcut to mm -hmm. financial freedom mm -hmm. in certain senses, right? You think about it, that the traditional way to financial freedom is a nine to five job. You save enough, save up enough, buy a house, hopefully appreciation takes you to a millionaire. Mm -hmm. That's the traditional way of going about it. So trading can be a shortcut in the sense of you can reach those goals quicker because of the returns that you have on your time, your energy, your capital. Mm -hmm. The problem is though, is that in order to become a successful trader, there are no shortcuts. So yeah. trading is a shortcut, but there are no shortcuts to becoming successful at it. Mm -hmm. There are things that you can do, hacks in which way that you can train your brain. I think that biohacking is a very interesting way to go about that. I think that a lot of the mental approaches that we've already talked about have are ways that you can sort of hack your brain into making your timeline quicker, mm -hmm. but there is no shortcut. And if you wanna succeed at this, it's gonna take years. Like I. For me personally, I didn't have to do as bad as I did those first two years. I mean, let's just be honest, right? Like that was, it was bad. Depositing a paycheck on a Friday, blowing it by Wednesday. Like mm. you, there, you don't need to be doing that by any means. But I do think that there's this line of diamonds require pressures, uh, require pressure to form. Yeah. And so in order for a diamond to exist and a diamond, a, if you are a successful, consistently profitable trader, you are a diamond in the rough because mm. these numbers are not in your favor. But in order for that to get there, you need pressure. You yeah. need to go through these types of situations. I didn't need to lose 50000 before I even found any success, but I did need to take hits. And I needed those emotional lows because you need those to build off of them, right? Mm -hmm. you, you almost need a, a, a rock bottom in, on some level, right? Yeah. And it's just about making sure that when you feel that you've reached that rock bottom point mm -hmm. that you're like, okay, this is my rock bottom. It's different from here on out. You have to be the one to take charge and make, I'm, now I've hit my lows, and spoiler alert, in every year as a trader, at least for me personally, I've hit new emotional lows every year, right? Mm. Just, just because as you scale your position sizes, as you, as you continue to grow and all that, you make mistakes. And mm -hmm. so for me now, even to this day, I have times where I take way bigger losses than I should, right? And like my biggest loss in 2023 is bigger than my biggest loss in 2022, right? Mm -hmm. Like at some level, you'll reach a plateau on position sizing, but it's not the lows that you reach aren't going to be like a one-time low. These are, as a trader, in my opinion, at least, it's going to continue to come with those lows and lows and lows. So it's about finding those bottoms and then coming back off them and realizing that it all starts with the effort you put in, right? Yeah. It all starts with how much energy and effort you put into it. Definitely, no, it's all about that action. And it's interesting you say that about the you know, mistakes and uh, the emotional lows, mm -hmm. because people I think have a misconception of trading, especially profitably and consistently. They assume that it's just easy then. Yes. And that, you know, they uh, will just have wins. Yeah, they they understand they'll have losses, but that's it. Like you know, it's mainly going to be wins. They'll be able to read the market. They won't have any stresses. But what is the reality? You know, do you still make mistakes? Do you still you know, are you still imperfect or are you a perfect trader? Uh, I think for everybody, the answer is imperfect, right? Like that should be. It's hard to be a perfect trader. Otherwise, are, are you a computer? Like I don't I don't understand. Right there, I feel like there is no level of perfect. And there's this diagram that I absolutely love where it shows what people think success is, and it's a straight line, mm. and then what people what success really is, and it's move up, followed by a bunch of twirls, then another move up, more yeah. twirls, and then there's no direct line from A to B where you're supposed to be, okay, this is where I'm at now, this is where I wanna be in two weeks. If that's your, if that's your timeline, if you're putting that kind of pressure on yourself, no matter whether that's a two week or a six month timeline, I feel like it's unrealistic. Mm. There's no direct path to success as a trader. It's going to be different for literally everybody. Yeah. No, no, it's so, so true. And um, I mean, do you think like social media has been like a negative in that standpoint? I would, absolutely. And this is coming from someone who I'm on social media a lot, right? I love I love social media. I have so much fun with the account that I have. I just, I mean, you see, it's, it's just a lot of funny stuff, right? Yeah. That's my goal. But I also, there are the serious elements of it. There are the educational elements of it. I think that the problem with social media is that it puts unrealistic expectations on what you need to have as a trader. Mm -hmm. And it takes also, it also kind of pushes you to go at paces that you're not ready to go at, mm -hmm. right? And that you see these social media stories of a trader. Like I heard one time a story of a guy who after his first six months of trading, he became consistently profitable and then made like 300 grand in the first year. And I was like, after six, like you, you figured that all out after six months, mm -hmm. like, Man, I, after six months, I was still, I didn't even know what I was doing, right? And so I understood that that person might have worked harder for me, but there's also that it puts this like unrealistic expectation in your head. Mm -hmm. I would say that most people take 
three or four years before they start finding success, success as a trader. I didn't go full time as a day trader until I've been trading for four years. So mm. it's pretty much like I went and got my college degree in day trading, then went full time, yeah. right? Like, mm-hmm. And so I think that the biggest downsides of social media have been, one, the pressure put on you for some sort of timeline. Mm-hmm. And then two, I think that, and this is all just personal preference, but I think that the the lifestyle element of how so- trading has been portrayed on social media has also brought a negative effect to it, mm. right? Because it brings people to trading for the, not necessarily the wrong reasons, but it, it attracts, I don't want to say people trade for the wrong reasons, but I think that attracts them for the wrong reasons, mm. right? Like, for just for reference, I have absolutely zero issue with anybody who's who owns a, uh, a supercar, right? Or owns multiple supercars. Badass. If you're a car person, hell yeah, mm. go do that, right? I'm not a car person. I've driven. I live in LA. I've driven like 200 miles mm. in the past like a year and a half. So I like me having a supercar. Me having that makes no sense, mm-hmm. right? And so on my type of feed, the content that I post has nothing to do with that. And I think that relates to a lot of people. But I think that the problem is that if you are somebody who ha- who's who that is what you love that is a passion of yours cars are then there's zero there's nothing wrong with that but that allure of bringing people in makes it seem like if you trade you x equals y trading yeah. equals supercars or yachts or whatever the case may be right and this is coming from someone who's wearing nice clothes right like I'm wearing nice clothes I have a decent watch right but like mm-hmm. these things don't drive me these things aren't the things that like make me and I feel like that's one element of social media where I, I worry about it a little bit is that it, it b- attracts people to trading for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong with somebody who has a passion for supercars, but I or, or not just supercars, but watches any of that. I have zero problem with it. I don't want it to sound like I'm coming bad on anybody because mm. I truly am not. But I, I worry about the unintended consequences of that being a reason to draw people into trading. Because if you're drawn in for that reason, I think you're more likely to have that flip account mindset rather yeah. than growth mindset, yeah. right? And I think that... So social media, it's a trickery, it's a slippery slope and a tricky, tight line to walk because without people on social media, I would have never found trading, right? I know that for folks, I think there's a lot of different ways that people found it. Mm. I found it through Instagram. All my friends found it through Instagram. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's a a slippery slope because I want to continue to share. I want to continue to inspire people on social media. But I also understand that there are some serious downsides of what I post, right? There are some serious downsides of, and not necessarily downsides, but there will be times where I'll post something on social media. Let's say I'm watching a particular stock or a particular pair or whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. And I say, you know, I'm I'm bullish. I think that this – I want to buy – I want to find buys on this particular stock. I think this setup is good. Mm-hmm. As soon as I say those words, as soon as I say I'm looking at this thing mostly, there are traders who are still developing, still learning, still trying to get – figure out where they want to mm-hmm. go, who they are as a trader – who will then instantly look at that and be like, this is my opportunity, this is my shot to make a bunch of money yeah. off of that trade, yeah. right? And so I feel like there's, it's just a tight line. It's a very slippery slope, and it's a tight line to walk, mm-hmm. tight rope to walk, um, where social media has a lot of these pros and a lot of these cons. Yeah. And so if there was one piece of advice that I would have to someone who's trying to learn and is going through and follow it and is on social media, it would just be... Find people that resonate with you and follow them, not everybody. Mm Because if you follow everybody, there's a whole lot of different – it's like it's shiny object syndrome, right? But if you're able to find people that resonate with you, whether those are the ones who have the supercars or whether those are the ones who live in the woods, which Mm -hmm. is not me, but Mm -hmm. whatever the case may be, find the ones that you resonate with and be like, okay – these are who I, I trust to provide me with information that's valuable to me, yeah. right? Yeah, I think that's the biggest key and takeaway for sure. Definitely, and I think there's definitely uh, you know responsibility on the on the person viewing the content as well, not just the content creator, because as you said, like you know if you were to post a trade and um, you know a trade idea or, or not even a trade idea, you're just posting what you're looking at. Mm-hmm. You know? so you're not even trying to do anything like that. You're just saying, hey, I'm looking long today then there's a responsibility of, okay, I can listen to that and then say, let me go look at why he's long. Yes. That's the educational side. Yes. But if they're just going, okay, I'm going, I'm going straight in, I'm going straight in, and that's it. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to make it off this. Then then that's obviously on them. You know, no one said anything like that. And that's their own perception or their own uh, maybe wrong mindset, essentially. The negative mindset, the wrong mindset, the, the 
inconsistent mindset. What I will say, though, is I, I definitely understand. Like I mentioned before, I think I had some of the worst habits mm. ever. Yeah, yeah. So I was the person that when I saw my previous mentors post a trade idea, yeah. I would go all in because I was like, I, it would give me, especially if I saw something within their trade idea that I was like, ooh, I see that too, mm -hmm. right? And so you're 100% right. At the end of the day, it's on the consumer in some sense to be like, okay, I see that they're, posi they're positioning this. I see that this is what they're seeing. I still have to manage my risk. I still just, and do my own analysis in order to come in, okay, am I coming to that same conclusion, mm -hmm. right? And I think that kind of ties back to what we were talking about earlier about asking good questions. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to be asking a question to be utilizing content in an efficient way, mm -hmm. right? And so we've talked about this before. This is right now in the content trading space is all out war. There's so many people providing so many things and mm -hmm. so many different stuff. There's so many different things that you can hear. I think on some level it's great because it's information for all new beginner traders. It's mm -hmm. going to reach more people. More people will find out about it. But on some level it's also hard because it's like which – it's like I'm seeing all this stuff, but I'm not really – actually utilizing it the right way. And yeah. so the right way to utilize things would be the same way of asking a right question. Mm -hmm. You see someone post a trade idea, you see someone post their analysis, rather than trying to mimic it or follow it, reverse engineer it, mm -hmm. right? Reverse engineer it. And I think that's like a big hack of trading. I keep mentioning these hacks, but that's one that's really big to me too, mm -hmm. is finding a way to reverse engineer what someone else is seeing or saying, mm -hmm. right? And so if you see a trader say that they struggle with X, X, and Y, Start to reverse engineer and be like, okay, what what are some, some traits that I can of, of people who don't struggle with that, mm -hmm. right? Like, what are some other things that I can start to identify to really fix my perception of what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. No, definitely, because I've always said that you know, if someone if you ever watch anyone's content in terms of like a case study or mm -hmm. forecast, anything like that, the job really is to yes, listen to their words and understand their perspective and and their understanding from that chart. But then the most important thing to do is to go on that same chart yes. and mark it out yourself, right? Mark, yeah, you already see what they see because you've just watched a video, but what's most of all is look at the same trade and notice what you see because then that's the stuff that you're going to actually be able to use because you're not going to be able to just... You might maybe take one thing yeah. from someone else's perspective right, and their viewpoint. But otherwise, if you look at the same trade, the same chart, and you see maybe three different confluences, they're the three, though, that will work for you yes. for the long term because they're the ones you actually see. Yes, you know, So you're not blind to them. You're, the other ones might be blind to you, but they're just on your conscious mind because you just watched this video. You know, literally just, someone's just told you, oh, this is why I look there. Um, and yeah, I don't think people really take that advice, but I think it is definitely a hack because it's like, there's one thing watching a video and watching how someone else will do it, but then there's another thing actually, okay, let me go review this and see how I would do it. Yes. And then that leads us on to, just before we move on to this actually, because that'll probably be a broader topic, but the last one on social media is what, what was the motivation with you starting social media? Let's take a break for a minute there, guys, because I want to tell you about our other sponsor, Trade Zeller. Now, Trade Zeller is something I only wished I had during my journey because I would have saved myself so much time and more importantly, money. Because Trade Zeller is the greatest automated journaling software on the market. That's right. Automate it. All you have to do is connect your MetaTrader 4, MetaTrader 5, and it will pull up all of your data with all your statistics. It goes so in depth from obviously your losses, the days, the times. It allows you to bar replay so you can actually see that trade as if it was live. Absolutely incredible. It's an absolute game changer for everyone's trading journey. Without data, how can you make a statistical edge? I went through so much time without collecting data, without journaling. And why was that? Because most people find journaling very tedious when in reality, why not have it automated and all done for you? All you do is just add the notes. As part of Tradezilla, you also have playbooks. So if you have different entry drills, you can list them all out so you can categorize your trades. Tradezilla is for everyone, whether you trade options, whether you trade Forex, whether you trade prop firms, or even just your own personal account. It is here to revolutionize the trading journey. Make sure you click the link in the description below and use the code RIZ10 for 10% off. Go take a look at the link in the description. Let's get back to the episode. Yeah, absolutely. This is a great question. I love um, my social media journey has been a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. I I have so much fun on my stories every single day. I like to make it as personable as I can while mm -hmm. also providing you know as much value as I mm -hmm. can. And for me, I had been working in the Discord space for other groups and other uh, creators and all that for two-ish years, kind of after I had started to find my footing a little bit, I started to be like, okay, 
How can I be of value to you here? How can you be of I be of value mm-hmm. to you there? And then I went full time as a day trader in early 2021. Mm-hmm. And then after doing that for like six, seven, eight, I think almost nine months of full time day trading with no social media, I was like, okay, but I think I should. I, I think I would enjoy starting a little bit of a social media, starting to see if okay, can I help relate to others? Can mm-hmm. I start helping to bring others the same sort of knowledge that I have, right? And originally it was mostly just intended as can, you know, can I post this analysis here and see what, and get feedback, right? Or, or help people out or something mm-hmm. like that. But it blew up really quickly. It blew up very, very quickly. I, and I, I have a very addictive personality. Yeah. Kind of, I have very bad ADHD. I'm very addictive. So I made an Instagram account, again, six or nine months after I'd been a full-time day trader for that time. And as soon as I started it, I fell in love with it, right? Mm-hmm. I fell in love with creating. I fell in love with making videos. I fell in love with really the Instagram stories where I could connect to people on a deep level, mm-hmm. right? And so I started to then create this. I had all my reels, which were all educational, all this, but it almost is like people have described it to me before, which I don't, it's just funny to me. as like my own little personal reality TV show on yeah. my Instagram stories. Yeah. And it's almost kind of true in some level, right? Yeah. Where I can really just be myself. Mm-hmm. And so while I do a lot of educational things on my story as well. It's also a lot of me being myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that what I've found is that the amount of people that I relate to on that level Mm -hmm. is unreal. Because like we talked about before, the first part of social media that you think of when you hear trading is the luxury items, right? That's the first, those go hand in hand, right? And so my goal of creating a social media is I was like, I want to make an account that's like, I'm just like this regular dude who trades, right? Like I'm just like this regular guy who like, I, I will head winning trade and then, you know, have a good night. And then the next morning, you know, I, or whatever the case may be, I'll be doing XX and Y. I'll go play basketball. I'll go do this. I didn't have to be living this, like, crazy, luxurious lifestyle. Mm-hmm. But I also, I'm the type of, I love to have fun. I like to go out and drink. I'm uh, an avid pot smoker. It's like, I, I like these things. And I could be myself. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, there was this group of people that really resonated with me. And they were like, wow, like... This guy isn't just is selling something down our soul's throat the whole time. He's not forcing this issue. And a lot of his content is laughable, can make me funny, can make me relate mm-hmm. without compromising the educational value, mm-hmm. right? So for me, it's almost like on some level it allowed me – and I said this – I don't know if I've ever said this before on a podcast, but social media allowed me to be me, right? Yeah. Like it allowed me to like – because with your friends – It's not like with my close personal friends, I could always be myself. But then you graduate college, you go out, you meet new people, you try and grow your social circle, you try and grow your friend group. And for me, when you're in those first few stages of meeting new people, you don't want to like be weird. Mm, You know, you want to be normal. You want to put out a good first impression. Social media allowed me to just, I could do whatever I wanted. I was Mm -hmm. like, you're choosing to follow me. So if you're, if you don't like my stories about me making a joke and smoking a joint, then I'm just going to assume you're going to unfollow me. Yeah, yeah. And so it really allowed me to be like, okay, this is who I am. Take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked at how many people were like, oh, dude, me too, right? Like people were like, yeah, I'm weird too. Like (laughs) I'm all over the place too. Like you're chaotic. I'm chaotic, right? And it really, it allowed me to be me, and now that the part that I'm so, so grateful for on social media, above literally anything else, mm-hmm. is that earlier I had mentioned how when you meet a new group of friends, you don't feel comfortable sometimes being your fullest self just because mm-hmm. you want to make a good impression. I don't care anymore. Now, whoever I meet, obviously I'm respectful, good impression, I'm, I'm always, right? But I'm me, too, because mm-hmm. I'm like, if I'm comfortable being public in front of 60,000 people on an Instagram story, they're an Instagram or whatever, then meeting new people for the first time, it allowed me to feel more comfortable in my own shoes. It allowed me to be like, I this is who I am. Mm-hmm. I'm a really nice guy. Uh, I'm a little quirky. I'm a little chaotic. Mm. But this is who I am, right? And for me, I felt like that propelled my relationships forward a lot faster, right? And it allowed me to start even in real life. So mm-hmm. I'm really grateful for social media. It started off as a way for me to just try and connect with people and help educate people. And it somehow turned into me finding out who I truly am Mm. and I'll never, I I don't think I'll ever, I think I'll always forever be grateful for that. Always. Definitely. No, it's incredible to hear. It's interesting how you have that, uh, that insight though. Mm -hmm. A lot of people might not have seen that or recognize that about themselves off the back of the social media side of things. Do you ever experience any sort of like hate or negativity on your side of things or? Very rarely, which has been, yeah, I, there is, there's one like joking, I consider it a a joke of like, you know, me and one guy don't get along so well every now and then, but really I've had zero negative feedback or Mm -hmm. hate or anything like that just because I think it's also what you put out into the world, right? And so 
if you're coming on and after you had a winning trade, you come up and you're like, just nailed this, we, we're the best, all that, blah, 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 then you're going to get hate, naturally, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And I think part of the mission statement I have of the content that I create is to be no sugarcoat, like it's very real, right? Mm-hmm. So there will be days where I'm like, like I think it was on uh, Wednesday of last week, I took a big loss and I made a story post and I was just like, me and the market had a fist fight today. <laughs> it won in a very dramatic fashion. Mm. I got my butt kicked. We're back at it tomorrow, right? Like people like the sort of authenticity in that sense. And I think that if you're transparent in what you're doing, which mm-hmm. is the first step in everything behind social media, but if you're transparent in what you're doing and you're not constantly bragging, I think that it, it, it's hate will always come in social media. But if you just put off good energy and good vibes, that slows down dramatically. Some mm-hmm. of the horror stories that people I know that have told me about hate comments and stuff that they've received, I'm like, I feel I have never gone through that. Like, I was like, I don't even, couldn't even fathom that, right? Mm. Like, and even if I do get a couple negative comments every here and there, the kind of thing where it's like, I look back and I always just laugh. It's always just a laugh to me now because I'm like, okay, like, thank, I, I'm glad you don't like me. Thanks for telling me. You could have just unfollowed, but no worries. We'll just, yeah. I'll just block you. So, I think they get something out of it, don't they? Yeah, they get something out of it. And so my I'm response... I'm going to follow you now. <laughs> I'm like, okay, sweet. Like, <laughs> like, I'm like, really, that made a huge difference in my life. Yeah. One person who I didn't know existed until today now unfollowed me. Ah, so sad, right? <laughs> like, But I think for me, I always, like, my, my go-to line, because I will say probably, like, once a month, I'll check my message requests, and I'll have someone be like, oh, just, you know, something negative, whatever yeah. it might be. My go-to response is, um, have a nice life, hope to see you never, right? It's like, have a nice life, I wish you nothing best, hope to see you never, mm. right? And, I, and then for me, it's done. I'm on mm. with it. I'm on with my life. Yeah. I don't, nothing, I, I bring none no of that baggage, home with yeah. me. Yeah, That's no baggage true. whatsoever. You know, in regards to, uh, you mentioned that, like, having friends who do get hate, mm-hmm. right? Is there anything that you can sort of correlate or sort of observe in terms of the sort of content they post? Is it polarizing content? Is it profits? Is it lifestyle, anything? I think that a lot of it is lifestyle. I won't lie. I think a lot of it is lifestyle. Because here's the assumption. Here's the the elephant in the room about creators who are traders, right? Mm -hmm. Is that they also typically sell some sort of product or course, right? Mm -hmm. So most often the line of, of criticism that I see is that people come up and like, oh, you're buying this with with money from courses. You're not actually a trader. You're not actually doing that, right? And so I think that really it is the lifestyle things that probably draw the most, which makes sense, mm-hmm. right? It, I mean, there that's where feelings of jealousy start to come out, feelings of all that start to come out. But I think that the most common way that you'll get is a combination of like, hey, not only do I have this nice stuff, but I'm going to rub it in your face that I have this nice yeah. stuff, right? And I think that the people who don't rub it in their face, right, like, there's somebody, for example, who I know you spoke to last night, Lambo Raul. I yeah. know Raul. No, I never met him, but him and I have talked on Instagram a bunch. Great guy. He is is Lambo Raul, but he doesn't rub it in your face as much as it, he, he. For him, at least for me, I can tell he purely he loves cars. Like the man mind. just loves cars, and so he's not showing it in your face in the sense of like, in the sense of like, if you don't have this, you suck. He's mm. more like, I love this stuff. I'm gonna show it. Mm-hmm. I think that there's more. There are going to be times where there's other people out there, and I don't even know that there's someone specifically I'm thinking of, but there's other people out there who they come across, and that is what it's almost like they're using that to make you feel bad about yourself. Yeah. And that's going to draw a lot of hate, mm. right? Because then all of a sudden, rather than trying to be an inspiration or rather than trying to show people what's possible, you're, you're more saying, hey, I'm better than you. And I reached my goals. And that's the stuff I don't love, right? Mm. That's the stuff I don't love. That's, and I think that I don't love it, but I think that's also where what naturally draws hate towards people, right? Is that this idea that, hey, I'm showing you this stuff not to show you what's possible mm. because I want you to see I'm better than you, right? I want you to see that I'm the best. I want, I want all my friends watching this and being like, man, he's mm. the man, you know, all that. Naturally, I think those are going to be pe- creators that are drawn more negative criticism. Right? Yeah, no, it makes sense. It's like correlation, you know, like a... Mm. Uh, there's that correlating factor of, on like a scale, if you will. Yeah. You know, the more that you go onto that side of things of, of trying to, you know, put it, push it in people's faces, whether it's lifestyle or profits. Or even. Profit. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Profits. The same, same principle. And, and, same and polarizing content as well. Polarizing content will do it even if it has no lifestyle or profit. Yes. Because that's well, that's how it's designed. <laughs> it's, it's designed. Polarizing content is like is meant to do that. It's know? meant to be like, hi, I'm yelling at you. Like, if you do X, X, and Y, you're not a real trader. It's yeah. like, wait, what? Like, yeah. I, I'm, hi, I'm a real trader. I don't do any of those, yeah. right? Like, yeah, I think that content naturally is always going to be that's aggressive. Fine, yeah, because I was just interested there because I want to see that thing. So, like with Raul, I actually did a podcast with him yesterday. He, you're right. He, I, 
I've met people who say they like cars. You know, they're, they're into cars. He loves cars. He's into it. Next, but it makes sense as well, and it goes like way deeper because he, in his compound, he has like the go karts he would race in as a kid. Yep. So it's not like a, a passion that's new or just because he he's made money. It's it's always been the like, always been. His winning. dad showed us his like overalls from when he was like three years. You know, Raul was like five or something. It was it was wild. But um, but yeah, then I learned okay, that's passion. That's, that's when you passion. know you have a passion. You, know, you can break down all the cars. He knows everything about all the cars. I'm lost. I even said to him, I don't know nothing about this. <laughs> you know, I don't know anything about this. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. And, and final question in terms of the social media yeah. side. You know, it happens a lot in Forex. I'm not sure about on your side. Um, but it's like, how do you find time to trade and make content? Right? Mm. That's what a lot of people try and say. So what would your response to that be? Yeah, so I, it's, it's a process, right? In the beginning stages of my social media career, I was filming on my phone mm. and I was... So for me personally, in the beginning stages, my first videos would take me, like, I got it down to a science at some point. They would take me two or three minutes, right? Mm -hmm. I would say what I got really, my videos that blew up quickly ones, I was like, one stock I'm watching tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If this does this, I'm looking for that. If mm -hmm. this does this, I'm looking for that, right? And I filmed those off my phone, and they took me maybe three minutes to record, mm -hmm. right? So on that level, there isn't, there wasn't much work to be done. Nowadays... What I do is I have a videographer will come over, mm -hmm. we'll set up a camera, I'll have like 10 different outfits, we'll record 40 different, we'll spend six hours on a Sunday yeah. recording 40 different clips, right, 50 different clips. So it's become a much more efficient process mm -hmm. right now. Um, that process in and of itself is an expensive process, right? Yeah. That's one of the things I think with content creation that people don't understand is that as you scale, it becomes a bigger investment, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to put, and especially we were talking about this with the l amount, sheer amount of content out there nowadays. In order for yours to succeed, it has to, it has to, um, it has to be good, mm -hmm. right? Like you can't be making mediocre content mm -hmm. and grow anymore. There's just too many people out there putting together really great stuff. So, That's true. one of the, um, the other things that I really wanted to mention is that. There's Alex Ramosi has a line that I, I absolutely love from him where he said, because people asked him the same thing. They're just like, where do you come up with all this content stuff, right? And he was just like, I do cool shit and then I talk about it, right? And he's like, so the, for me, con for him, content creation is never all the topics he talks about, everything like that. Yeah, he's like, scripted I, and all that. Oh, this yeah. really, he's, like, he's like, I've done this. He's like, I've done this. He's like, so this was my real life, but now I'm talking about it, right? Mm -hmm. So for me with trading, I think the big advantage I had and one of the things that a lot of these newer creators don't necessarily do is that as soon as they hit their first success as a trader, they make a social media, yeah, right? Yeah. And then they start to do that, which I don't have anything wrong with that, but I think there's an inherent flaw in it that like, I was I was trading for four years before I made a social media. I was a full-time day trader, only income for nine months before I made any sort of social media, mm -hmm. right? And so I had gone through it. And so when I make content saying like, hey, this is a psychology thing that happened to me, X, X, and Y, mm -hmm. It's not something that I have to like plan out and script. It's real stuff that's yeah. happened to me, right? Like it's real things. I think on some level, there's an, a certain level of experience that comes with it, right? And I know that's for sure the same with you is now you've interviewed so many people. I'm sure you've become a better interviewer as you go, right? You gain, like you just, as you do things over and over mm. and over again, you become better at them, right? Yeah. And so, and as you do more things in trading and in life, you have more stuff to talk about, mm -hmm. right? And so um, I think the biggest thing for content creation is, if you've been around it long enough, right? If you've been around like trading the space long enough, mm -hmm. then some of the, the content creation part becomes easier because then it's just, this is what I did. Let me tell you about it, right? Mm -hmm. And that for me has made it so that content creation has, it's a hard job. It's a very hard job and there's a science to it, mm -hmm. but it's never been something that I've been like, that's so much work, right? It's a hard job, but it's not been, because it doesn't feel like work for me. It feels like mm -hmm. this is what I do, right? Like this is what, I imagine it's a little bit different for you because you were doing like eight hours filming many different podcasts, unreal, right? But for me in the, the short mm -hmm. form or even the YouTube videos that mm -hmm. I'm producing, um, it's it's do cool stuff, then make videos about it, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, because obviously it's how you do it. And like, and like you said, you, you'll get a, a chunk of time on a Sunday. Market's mm -hmm. closed, so. No trading. No trading. Doesn't impact the trading. Because that's the main thing they try and say. It's yes. like, how can you do it and trade? It's quite easy, I think. You know, obviously, like you said, in the beginning, it might be a bit harder because yeah. you're working out some systems and you're working out how you're going to get the flow of it and you're building your experience. But And you might be editing it all yourself, etc. Yes, yes. But in reality, yeah, even then, you choose when you want. Like, you're not going to sit there and be like, I'm a trader, so I'm going to, I trade at 8 a.m., so let me try and make content at 8 a.m. That doesn't make sense. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. <laughs> I trade at 8 a.m. till 12. But then at 12 till, let's say, 4, I have school. 
But then four till six, I don't do anything. I'll make content then. Exactly. That's all it is. Um, with me, obviously, it's it's similar. But obviously, I get to choose when I book in. Right. You know, stuff like that. So, and mainly if I trade, it's in the morning. I'm not. I'm not done a podcast at eight in the morning. Yeah, so, right. You know. So um, we're getting close there. We got to ten thirty a.m. this morning. So <laughs> we're edging that way. But yeah. Um, I would say one last thing on that, just for me, is that. With trading, it's almost with trading and with content creation, it's the same thing we talked about earlier. How much work do you want to put in, yeah. right? Because for me, the market. I live in California. The market's open from six thirty a.m. to one thir- one p.m. Mm. Uh, as soon as that, so I'm up each morning at four four thirty. I do a workout before market opens. Oh, nice. um, I mean, not I, I do cardio before the market opens. Get my brain awake, mm. right? Um, but I do that, and then so by the time. The market's closed, and I've taken my nap, and I've eaten, and I've gone for a walk, whatever the case may be. It's 4 or 5 p.m. After starting my day at 4 or 5 a.m., you have the conscious decision that you can make a choice and say, okay, I'm going to be done for the day, or okay, it's time to make content, or it's time to do this next thing that I have to do. Whether you're trading and you have a side hustle of photography or videography, and you're like, okay, I'm going to trade here to get this. It's time management, but it's also that work that work ethic level, yeah. right? Like for me... Again, it's that addictive personality. When I started to make the videos, the reels of one stock I'm watching tomorrow, because I would trade that day, and then that night, I would always make a video that said, hey, tomorrow, here's my top watch. We'll see what looks good in the morning, but this is what I'm watching mm-hmm. for now, right? Those videos would take me, eventually I got it down to a science of them taking me two, three minutes. They started off by taking 20, 30, you know, I'm again, going through all the process, yeah. going through all that. And I would edit those myself still. Um, but it's that question of, and there would be times where I would be, I'd be like, man, I really don't want to make a video tonight, and I'm just not going to. And then you do that for two or three, four days. Next thing you know, you see your reach drop, and you're like, oh, crap. Like, no, I can't do that. I got to be I gotta be stay working. On it, yeah. Stay on it. And so I think for me, the addictive personality, people, if, for those of you wondering, how do you fit in both? It's not that hard. The time, trading does not take 12 hours a day, and content creation does not take that much time. Like, it, it, in order to create good content, you have to be very smart, but it's not incredibly time intensive in most cases, mm-hmm. right? I think that's the way I balanced it. No, definitely. Definitely. And you, you mentioned something there that's our perfect segue into the next topic, which is uh, the addictive personality. Yes. Right? Uh, how have you, 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 most would say that's counter, you know, productive in terms of being a trader, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so, what challenges have you faced with having that? A trait in your personality and then trying to trade? Oh, man, uh, a lot of them. <laughs> I think I've had a lot of challenges through that. I think that, um, again, like we talked about earlier, on some levels, there's the days where you, and even now I'll still have my bad days where I feel like I'm trading for a dopamine hit than I am rather for that. So it's mm. taken some serious self-control, some serious complete like restructuring of how my brain works, mm-hmm. right, in order to avoid. So I've seen, I would say that all of the bad traditional trading habits that you see, revenge trading, over trading, you know, all those different things. I think the addictive personality kind of feeds into that and mm-hmm. can make them worse. But what I've tried to do is take my addictive personality and shift it to the productive things that mm-hmm. don't involve over trading, right? Mm-hmm. That don't involve revenge trading, that don't involve this. If I can give myself really clear guidelines and structures when I'm trading, mm-hmm. Right, and I can be addicted to following those guidelines and structures because that's what's rewarding me mm-hmm. now. Right, in order now that I'm addicted, now that I've I have this addictive personality, I'm still addicted to trading, but now I'm addicted to doing it right. Right, mm-hmm. now I'm addicted to knowing. Okay, these are my setups. This is what I'm willing to take. These are days that I'm not willing to take, and I'm addicted to the process. Mm-hmm. Now, right, I think that that is how I was able to kind of translate it in the negative sense. I think that. It definitely caused me to take plenty of days of overtrading. It definitely caused me to take plenty of days where, you know, back in the day, you 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 blow an account and you wire money in the same day because you want to make it back. It's like, yes. it's like, oh my gosh, like I, you know. So there are definitely still times and traits that I've had those sort of ad talks, and that's also had to lead me. I do some very specific things in order to keep my profit safe, in order to keep my habit safe, mm-hmm. right? Like I have very strict rules and discipline because I know that no matter how good you are as a trader, I can't tell you how many people I know who made a bunch of money in 2020, 2021, 2022, and 2023, and then I've now at zero, mm. right? Because no matter how far you've gotten, there's still this threat of going on tilt. And having one bad day to completely wipe you out. For me, it happens every year. I'll have a day where I don't try, try to avoid it, but it'll always happen every once a year where I'm like, man, 
I can just feel I'm in that zone where mm. it's a terror where it's like, you know, you just keep averaging down or you just keep doing that. And for me, there's always those days where the addictive personality, the downside will kind of come back into play. But the best thing that I've thought of to do is be like, okay, how can I become addicted to the process? Right. So for me, that becomes waking up early every single day, mm -hmm. waking up early. I do a cardio workout. There's, there's this image where they look at a human's brain mm -hmm. after sitting still and a human's brain after walking for 20 minutes. Mm. It's night and day. The activity levels, your alertness, all that. So I'll do – now I have this strict morning routine, and if I'm able to follow that every day and be addicted to the following of that process, yeah. as soon as the market opens or as soon as I'm willing to take trades, it becomes a lot easier for me to follow my rules, right? Like I followed all the rules I had pre-market. Mm. Now it's time to follow the rules once the market opens, right? And I think, yeah, just I would say being addicted to the process, being addicted to the processes, be, transitioning my addiction from dopamine hits to process. Interesting. And what was the, was there anything in particular that helped you bridge that gap? I think the morning routine was a, was a big one, right? Which people talk about that all the time. I think that your morning routine has to be very specific to you as yeah. a human being. Like, mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be – all it has to be is something that triggers and hacks your own brain mm -hmm. into following those rules better. So – one of the things that really helped propel me to my breakout, where this year, my, my year, it was uh, right when I'd gone full, or a little like three months after I'd gone full time, yeah. I started to scale up my sizes a little bit. And I started, um, I started to increase my position sizes a little bit. And in order, sorry, I just totally lost my train of thought. I just really am like, what were we talking, what was the, um, the scaling your breakout year. The scaling, the breakout year, right? Oh, the habit, the morning routine. That's it. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> that, that morning routine for me, the one of the things that happened in my breakout year is that I started to recognize that I was having some trouble right when I had gone full time. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason why is because I was waking up every morning and I was trading, I was rolling out of bed, going over to the desk, doing my analysis, all in my pajamas. Right, which is it's in California at six AM. I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that. Mm. But I was going to the desk in an unprepared uh, – I was in, in all of a sudden, I could have been prepared with my technicals. I could have been prepared with my, my trading plan, mm -hmm. all of that. But from a literal perspective of am I awake enough right now to be trading, most of the time the answer to that question is was no. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I would do, literally, if I did this for about a year and a half straight, is I would put on a pair of what I call funky pants. And they are just pants with – you know, checkers or flannel patterns or mm -hmm. ones that you would see. If someone was running at a party, you'd be like, damn, those are some funky pants, right? Those are a little <laughs> bit out there. Those, those belong in the 70s a little bit, you know? Yeah. And I had like four or five pairs, and every day I would do that. Every day I would wake up, and my rule was if I didn't have enough, if I wasn't awake enough to get out of my sweats and put on real pants, mm. I probably didn't wasn't awake enough to trade that day, yeah. right? So it was a series of small things like that. And I know that that's not super... I know that's relatively generic advice. People have talked about the morning routine before, but you have to cater it to you. Mm. So what I would do is start waking up early and doing this pre-market workout, getting my legs moving, right? Getting my brain more active. Then all of a sudden I would shower, coffee, all that, and I would have the pants. That would be another start of my morning routine that mm. I do every single day without fail, right? Every single day without fail, I was putting those pants on. Then what I would do, which I had, did not do for many years of my life, was mm. make simply, I would make my bed. As, sound, as simple as it sounds, I would then go through the process of making my bet. Mm -hmm. Then every day, 10 minutes before a market opens, and I still do this part to this day, every single day, I listen to one song on one music video. Mm -hmm. For me, it's the song Best Day Ever by Mac Miller. Mm -hmm. It's um, The music video has a little kid in it who's really happy, but also it really is just that kind of reminds me that, hey, trading isn't everything, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's this little kid in this music video who's so happy no matter what I do today, I'm gonna be I'm in a good spot, right? Mm -hmm. Like I don't this this is not life or death. As much as it might feel like that when you're in the the trying to get there stages, it's not life or death. Mm -hmm. And so that song to me kind of reminds me of that. And then the title of it being Best Day Ever reminds me to try, hey, make this the best day ever, right? Like try and make this a good day. Whether your plan fails, whether it works, try and make this a good day, mm -hmm. right? And so all these little things that I started to do pre-market. Right, I became addicted to that process. Yeah. And I became addicted to every morning I do that. Right, people would inv invite me out on a Wednesday night to go do trivia, and I'd be like, I got to be up at four thirty the next day. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. I'm addicted to this routine. Right, I'm addicted to this process. And as soon as I found myself addicted to that routine, the minute that that routine became an everyday thing for me, my consistency, my consistency was already there, but my scaling was like, yeah. right, and it just really allowed me to be like, okay. Did you find it was the compounding? 
Yes. Like it was like it wasn't like straight away, maybe a month, but like as soon as that compounding effect started taking place, then you could see the correlation. And the longer you went, the bigger the correlation. Yes. I'd the say that the stronger the correlation. For me, the way I always like to describe it, and I think every trader has one of these moments, is the Nike check mark effect. Right? Mm. If you think of a Nike logo, that swoosh, right? It goes up and it's slow and it's it's going up though. It picks up pace, but at one point there's a moment where it goes whoo and it curls all the way around. Mm. I think that every trader throughout their life will go through a variety of Nike check mark effects, right? Mm. And I think that one of the biggest Nike check marks that I had where it made that slow progressive leap to a really fast, powerful mm. leap was that addicted addiction to the process right yeah. because then i was able to find other little things that i would do that would help me personally right and there was this that was that check mark effect allowed me to scale my position sizes in a way that i didn't think was possible right yeah. it went from i went from it was really i went from like five to seven hundred dollars average on a day or whatever you know i think it always varies but five to seven on average to being able to do three or four k on an average day right and not feel that and then within the span of three months I had scaled up to doing seven or eight K. Now every day is different. Trade opportunities will always present themselves in a completely different way. Not every day at all do you put risk on in anything like that. But I was able to sort of break through this going and I think that addiction to the process was really a big portion of it, right? And I think that allowed me to then build these other habits. Right? I built that morning routine. That was huge. And then I built these other little habits. Like I am a till the day I die I'm an advocate of withdrawals. Mm -hmm. I think that leaving money in your account. Um, and this is different with like a, a funded challenge account, but I think that like with a personal account that you funded, leaving money in there can lead you to do some bad things. And mm -hmm. so I, after finding out, I was like, okay, this is my morning routine. This is gonna be huge. This is a Nike check mark for me. Mm -hmm. I then went through a couple months, a couple months, a couple months. And my next Nike check mark was this realization that, hey, if I withdraw my profits on a daily or weekly, whatever the basis is, if I get them out of there, right, then I, I put myself in an even better mindset to scale, which sounds counterintuitive. You'd think the more you leave in there, the more it compounds and the more you scale. Yeah. But for me, the more I withdrew, the more I kept that in my bank, that was my next Nike check mark, right? Mm -hmm. So it was this series of Nike check mark effects that go that of me being addicted to them, right? So I became addicted to that early morning wake up the pants, then I became addicted to the withdrawals. And to this day, I'm still addicted to withdrawals. I, 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 I mean, who wouldn't be? That's yeah. a good problem to have, right? But I, even on days, I will do it very specifically in order to like, on days where I can feel myself like, okay, I had a big day yesterday. Mm -hmm. I need to take a withdrawal today because I can feel myself getting a little, being a little, you know, dangerous, mm. right? And what I will say is that it's always the days that you that I don't do that mm -hmm. that I still have my bigger losing days, right? Like last Wednesday was a day that I struggled, and I had a good Tuesday the day before, and it was one of those rare days yeah. where I say, you know what? I'm not going to withdraw. I'm not going to take our profits away. I'm going to – I think if there's a good setup tomorrow, we'll see what happens. Yeah. And I take a big loss, right? Like it's naturally the way that it goes. So for me – that was – sorry, I know I rant a little bit. I always no, no, tend to like, rant, but – um, it's, help, it's helping me today. <laughs> Um, but I would say that the being coming addicted to the process and then the process of the withdrawals, mm -hmm. huge for me, huge, huge, huge for me. No, definitely. And, uh, yeah, it makes complete sense how you can uh, associate the addiction to a positive habit. Yes. You know, most of the time we look at addiction, we always associate to negative. Yeah. I'm guilty of it, I'm thinking that way too. But then if we, we control our perception and we mm -hmm. can control, you know, at the end of the day, our mindset and our actions, uh, if we want to. You know, I think a lot of it comes down to that language and that intent and, and how we decide to frame the thought. So if we frame it in a way where, like you're saying, um, you know, getting addicted to a positive attribute, a positive habit that's going to lead you to progress rather than the opposite, which is what we always hear about in terms of addiction is obviously a negative. Yes. Um, so it's very interesting, very, very powerful. And I think a lot of people out there hopefully will be able to take note of that because it's probably something a lot of people struggle with subconsciously they don't yes. even realize you don't even realize it i think it's, it's almost like the same way if you think about it with like an alcoholic for example mm -hmm. they're addicted to alcohol most people who end up getting sober and getting everything back together then become addicted to aa they become addicted to going to alcoholics anonymous meetings so they're trading one addiction for another in some level i think that addiction is a disease that can like stick with you mm. and can really be no i mean i don't think i think that's the science behind it right mm -hmm. like and so i think that no matter if you're somebody who's felt what like you're 
it almost sounds weird to say, but if you felt like you're addicted to trading poorly, which I think there's a lot of people out there who are listening who are going to be like, whether I know it or not, mm. I'm addicted to searching for the dopamine hits and ended up trading poorly, right? Mm. You have to reshift that mindset because there is a way to use that to, to your advantage. Mm. I think now that that has allowed me to scale a lot quicker than some of my peers have mm. from a position sizing standpoint is because I'm addicted to that process. I am truly addicted to the process and the benefit process, mm. the good process of it. Definitely. No, definitely. And I think that's, that's actually a really good point. And probably I, I can imagine now a lot of people in the comments mentioning that being addictive to trading poorly. Yeah. Um, because it is something definitely to reflect on, I think, for people. But talking about uh, addiction, I actually had an addiction to weed for a very long time. Mm. Um, and I always used to uh, like watch you know, other people doing podcasts mm. or, or you know, articles online, wherever it may be, where it's like, you know, weed's harmless and uh, you can't get addicted to weed. And um, you know, not that everyone should smoke it, but like it's absolutely fine to smoke it. Right. And um, so it's, I made my own decision based, not based off that, but as in like, I believe the same thing. Like I'm yeah. not addicted. I just like, I just enjoy it. It's harmless. Mm -hmm. And uh, I enjoy obviously getting high at the time. But um, it, it, it took me a while to realize that I was addicted to it. Yes. Right. And that it took me a while to realize that for me anyway, as an individual, it was, um, it wasn't actually helping me. Right. You know, as I was convincing myself that it was. Right. I was convincing myself it allowed me to think and be more creative. Uh, allowed me to relax and switch off. But then I, I was just explaining to Tori on the last podcast that uh, for me, what it would be is like, especially in trading wise, I'd have a good day. Oh, let me celebrate by smoking. Mm -hmm. I had a bad day. Oh, let me feel better, better by smoking. smoking. Yep. So I would just find myself personally, I was an addict. So mm -hmm. I had to stop personally. And I've actually performed a lot better and had more clarity of mind after stopping. Mm -hmm. Bearing in mind though that there's another layer to it where I was smoking, I was over smoking. I was smoking so much. Yeah. You know, where I was probably smoking <clears throat> like four grams a day. Yeah. Um, so I was smoking a lot. Yeah. And uh, every single day for probably at least a year and a half or something. Mm -hmm. So I think it really damaged the, whether it's the uh, dopamine receptors or literally just it built that much of a habit that whenever I tried to do it with a balance, like once a week, or yeah. once maybe, my mind couldn't do it because it was like, it's just it's, it's intense. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like it's so used to that old way. Mm -hmm. Like go back there. So every single time it would be like uh, I'd convince my wife, like let me try for a week, please. You know, like it helps me. It's the one thing I enjoy. Um, and she'd be like, eventually be like, okay, but she she would always say that like, it never works. Yeah. Like, okay. And then I do one week, and then literally the next day, my my brain's like, ah, oh, it'd be nice to smoke again. Giant, still yeah. got some. So that was always the issue. Is like <laughs> when you buy it, you always have to buy it in bulk. Oh, in yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like. You want you want one or half of one, and mm -hmm. then suddenly you got one for like uh, enough for like a year. Yep. Um, but yeah, I just never I never found that uh, that balance. So then I made the conscious decision to just just cut, cut it out it. completely. Yeah, just cut it. Um, and it's been really really good. No, not just that though. Obviously, same with like alcohol, same with like loads of other things as well. Mm -hmm. Just uh, vapes and stuff. Yep. Like, I just cut it all out for me personally. But what what has been your experience? Yeah. So I this is an interesting conversation. I think that aside from trading, probably the most popular thing I'm known for would be um, my affinity for smoking. I'm a big pot smoker. Mm -hmm. I'm very open about it. I have been smoking since I was 16 or 17 years old. And it's, I had, I went through like a nine month period where I, I stopped for a job that I was working for. And I kind of that felt really good to prove to myself that I could stop. And mm -hmm. my life went on like normal. Right. Um, so it felt good to prove that like, I'm not physically addicted or anything. Like that. My mm -hmm. body wouldn't shut down. Like I've done this and I've gone through that, but for the, probably the greater half of the last 10 years, I've smoked pot every single day. Mm. And for me, somebody has asked me the question before. They're like, and actually a lot of people have asked me in my DMs where they're like, they're like, when are you going to quit smoking? When are you going to do this? When are you going to quit that? Blah, 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 blah. And my initial first response is I, I quit things that are bad for me, right? Mm. And so I personally, weed has only been a, bene a positive benefit in my life. And that is my opinion and my perspective about my own life. Mm. Now, Others out there, many in the comments or whatever, might be like, oh, you could do so much more if you didn't smoke. You could be so much more this. You could be so much more this. I'm really happy. Like, I'm so – that's one of the best things about, like, where I feel like where I'm at in my current life mm -hmm. is I'm, I'm aspiring to push to do more. I wanted that. But I'm also really happy. I don't think that anyone should tell you what should get in the way of your happiness, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, I found this balance where I smoke a lot of joints probably – Seven, a quarter a day, seven. Wow. Yeah, it, it's a lot. Of, I, I, it's it, it's a lot. And um, for me personally, it has been something where if that has ever started to hold me back, mm -hmm. 
then I think that I'll take a more proactive look at it at going. But for mm. me, I use it as a, some people have mentioned like the creative thing and some people have mentioned it as, I personally use it as a detachment tool. I like to, it helps me relax. Mm -hmm. Trading is very stressful. Trading is very intense. And so what I like to do is people, another question I get all the time is, do you trade when you're high? Do you smoke before you trade? I'm like, no, I'm not. I need to be alert. I need to be mm -hmm. focused. I need to be on my, I'm watching everything. So for me, what I like to do is it almost, it almost helps me set up a precedence too. Like in the mornings when I'll finish trading, I'll smoke a joint. And after I've smoked that joint, I I'm done trading for the day, right? Like, mm -hmm. unless I unless I take a few hours and then take a walk, get myself in the right headspace, right, all that. But for the vast majority of the time, after I smoke, I'm done trading for the day. So it's almost like a, a hard stop, too, that helps me, helps, again, with control those bad habits of, like, mm -hmm. over-trading, revenge trading. It almost is, it, it helps me in that sense as well. But I think that, you and I talked about this very briefly before, but I, I, I never openly told this story about my parents, but I think it's a fun one to tell. And almost mm -hmm. where I got this, where a lot of my experience with weed came from is that the very first time that I ever smoked in the eighth grade, I went and uh, I ended up getting my friend's mom caught him and mm -hmm. in turn caught me. So she, uh. she called me and was like, hey, I don't know whether I'm going to tell your dad or not, but I'm really upset all this, blah, blah, blah. And I was freaking out, but I was like... I should just go tell my dad right now. So I walked downstairs. I told my dad, and I was like, hey, you know, I, I want to just be straight up with you. I smoked some pot with my friend last night, blah, 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 blah. And he was, first thing he asked me is like, what'd you think? And I was like, at first time, I was like, I don't really know. I mean, I'm, it was cool, I guess, but I'm not, you know, I don't think it's like a big thing. And he looked at me, and he's just like, do you think it's going to get in the way of, of anything that you do? Do you think this one experience will do that? And I was like, I don't know. Like, I don't think so, right? Like, I don't think I had enough data to judge that at the time. Yeah. But hearing his response to me telling him that, I was expecting to get yelled at, right? Even though we had a great relationship, I was expecting him to get yelled at. Mm. I was expecting me to get yelled at. And one of the things that he he told me is he was just like, he was just like, as long as you and I have an open communication on how, who you are, right? He's like, I'm not going to get mad at you. It's for stuff like this. Mm. And the other thing he mentioned to me, and he kind of, I don't, he never really said it, said it, but he essentially said, if you get a 4.0, Jake, I really, which in America, that's perfect grades, right? Yeah. He's like, all A's. He's like, if you get a 4.0, I really can't say anything, right? He's like, I'm not telling you it's okay, but if you have a 4.0 and you spend a lot of time with your family, what what, what negatives can we have? Can we can we draw from that, right? Mm. So that literally put me in a mindset from a young age. I was like, okay, I'm gonna work really hard and I'm gonna get a 4.0, I'm gonna get all A's, and then if I ever get caught smoking or going to a party, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that my parents and I are gonna be on good terms about it. Yeah. It won't be the end of the world. And that's exactly what happened. We built this incredible relationship where I spent a ton of time at home with my family, I got really good grades, but I also had more freedom than any of my friends. Any of them by far. I, was, I could go stay, do two sleepovers on a weekend night, no problem. I could be gone the entire weekend. And, and as long as I checked in with my parents, they were right? like all these different freedoms. Mm. And they have been times where they came up to my room and they smelled some joints being smoked. Right. And all this kind of things. And we'd have this conversation. But it's like I'm crushing it in school. Right. Like I'm, I'm doing speaking. I'm doing all this stuff. Like I, I'm just I enjoy smoking the joint every now and then. My dad, And literally it'd be the kind of thing where they would never like fully approve of it, especially while I was in high school. No parent approves, so mm. to speak. But they were this there was this kind of trade off where it was like, OK, if you work if you get good enough grades like i'm gonna be i'm accepting of who you are because you're showing me that you're working really hard yeah and i think that the, i honestly think that it's that correlation between the two that has stuck in my brain now that i'm like just because i smoke doesn't mean i can't work my butt off mm. right i'm up at 4 a.m every day i'm trading i'm doing this then i teach classes at 6 p.m at night so it's a 13 hour day sometimes it's long i hop on a 24 hour plane flight to come see you like mm. there's these things i work really hard right as as all of us who are in this space do and so for me what i found is that as long as i work really really hard mm. this isn't a negative for me right like this isn't something and it's not that way with everybody right with that with some people you find that you you your productivity levels go down or you know, that's probably the most common thing that people find is that they're... Do you think it's uh, a conscious choice, though, for to, that to happen? For, like for me, if I was to smoke, I, my productivity would go down. Uh, well, it's interesting you say that, actually, because when I was on it, like when I was smoking a lot yeah. like, every day, it it wasn't really getting high anymore, if that makes sense. Yeah. There was something to it, obviously, otherwise mm -hmm. I wouldn't do it, but it wasn't like now that I've taken a break, if I smoke now, yeah. I won't do nothing. No, I'll be like a zombie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I find it strange because it's like obviously tolerance levels is, is is a thing, but like this, the 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 difference is massive. Yes, 
you know, because, um, yeah, when I was smoking back then, I was smoking loads, but it wasn't, it was like maintaining. Uh, right, it wasn't. Uh, I could still go to gym and I could still do the work that I was doing. Well, if I did it now, I wouldn't be able to even speak yeah. like this. Mm -hmm. you know? I'd probably just want to sit in a room and just watch TV or something, you know? But like, have you smoked today, for example? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. like, you're, you're still very energized, you know, still yeah. being able to articulate and everything. So this is why I've always said to everyone when I, I don't debate people. I don't like say you need to do this. Oh, 100%. And I never say, say on the flip yeah. side, I never tell people you should smoke weed, yeah. right? Yeah. But I met people like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. To be fair, I used to be like that. When I was the one smoking, I yeah. used to be like, you know, I used to say to my family, you just try it. You know, everyone mm -hmm. should try it. You can relax. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> relax. But, um, but yeah, but I do say to people, because I think there is a problem where there's a lot of people who have an addiction mm -hmm. in a negative way, and they're just not seeing it. They're yes. just not seeing it. And it's not because of any particular people, but I do think there's like a kind of a culture of, oh, it's fine. Yeah. You know? Not just with weed, though. With uh, vapes, for sure. Yes. That's a big thing now. Uh, with alcohol, with uh, caffeine, even. Mm -hmm. like, I think there's like a, a, a culture where it's just fine. You know, just it's chill, relax. Yeah, 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 yeah. When I think, especially in the trading space, I've advised, or not advised, but I've put tweets out saying, like, just test yourself. Like you said, like yes. with the nine-month thing, just mm -hmm. test yourself. If it's not a problem, you you won't have an issue testing yourself. Mm -hmm. Though the responses always are, you know, but I don't need to. Yeah, yeah. Right. If I wanted to, I, I would, but I don't need to. So yeah. it's fine. You know? um, so it's so interesting. You know? No, it's it's crazy interesting to me. And I think that it's one of the areas of... Because you mentioned that it's not just weed, right? People mm -hmm. come into it and there's there's vapes, there's um, um, adult content people yes, can get very really addicted now, to yeah. in a very bad way, right? Um, alcohol, all that. So for me, I don't want to say that like everybody has their vices, but on some level we do, do. right? Like, so, like we, I'm, I smoke hooker now, you know, yeah, like shisha. Right, which like I think that it's hard for me to define like what is a vice though, right? Mm -hmm. Like I think a vice is something that is not great for you that you know that is mm -hmm. a detriment and kind of holds you back. But really, I look at a vice as something that like sets you back, right? Like if I was somebody who, if on a Thursday night I was going out to the clubs and, and drinking and doing all this stuff and getting so drunk that the next day to Friday it was affecting my trading performance, mm. right, on a regular consistent basis, then that's a problem, right? Like that's something where it's starting to affect you. That's a vice, mm. right? For me, the way that I look at it is that, and people can debate the health of smoking and all that. I'm not talking about health, but I'm mm -hmm. talking about the the actual what does it do to my life to be considered a vice or mm -hmm. a negative or a drawback. And for me, I've always looked at it as it doesn't, I think that it helps me, whether it helps or just keeps me neutral is up for debate. Mm -hmm. But I think for me personally, it's whatever vices that you have, it's all about being in control of them, right? Mm -hmm. So like you said, the most common response that people have when you tell them to take a break is like, well, I don't need to, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, if you say you don't need to, it's worth trying to do it for a mm -hmm. day or two, right? Like at least give yourself a couple of days. For me, having that nine month where I worked that job, we were potentially to get drug tested, all that. So I just didn't want to risk it. Of course. And I think that also speaks to like the mindset behind it is that it's whether whatever it is, alcohol, weed, money, adult content, whatever mm -hmm. the case that it might be, it brings out who you really are, right? Yeah. And so for me, when I had those nine months where I couldn't smoke because I didn't want to lose my job, mm -hmm. that brought out the side of me that's like, this is my priorities. This is my work ethic. Like, this is my livelihood. Like, I'm not going to screw up my nine to five full-time job that I got, you know, they, they really wanted me for to smoke a couple of joints. Mm. That ain't worth it. In high school, all my friends would smoke on campus. They'd kind of sneak away to go smoke and all that. I was like, that, the risk, our risk reward is not there. Right? Yeah, yeah. The risk to reward is not there. Mm. So I think it really comes down to at the end of the day, um, does it amplify your negative traits mm. or does it work it with you in a certain way? And everybody will be different. Everybody will be different. Definitely. No, definitely. I couldn't agree more. I think, I think there's certain things where, where um, especially if you're on the come up, I think it's something my mom always said to me was whenever it's similar to yours, mm -hmm. but it's a bit more delayed. Um, <laughs> so like yours was like, get the 4.0. That's something you can do now. While my mom was like, become successful first. Yeah. When you, when you've made it to wherever you want to get to, then you can do what you want because you know, you've done it. You right. Know? You've done it then, but you don't want to have that point where you haven't made it. You haven't mm -hmm. had that progress. And then, these things are actually holding you back and then you don't know what if, you know, you've, yeah. maybe those were the things that held you back. Those are the Truly. things that stopped you from doing it. And like I said, I think there are a lot of people out there who need, just need to reflect, right? Mm -hmm. I definitely know there's people like yourself and I know, I know other people where, you know, they smoke, for example, 
op- it helps them to operate, if yeah. anything, mm-hmm. right? Uh, while I know the opposite is true for uh, a lot of people too. Where mm-hmm. I had one, I'll give you one example actually as a case study. I had a, it's like about two months ago, something like that. I had this student who for years, and he just wasn't getting the consistency. And for years, I've told him the same thing. Just quit weed for a bit. Yeah. You know? I said, quit weed, and then you'll be fine. I promise you. Mm-hmm. Right? Or at least you'll make progress. Test right. it. Right? Yeah, see. And every single time. Nah, you know, mm-hmm. Same thing. Like, if I wanted to quit, if I had a problem, you know, if I wanted to quit, but I don't need to. So, so I'm fine. Eventually, it came to a point where st- we're talking two years later. So I'm saying he's saying the same thing to me about his results. I'm saying the same thing to him, but this time I'm being more aggressive because I'm like, look, it's been two years. Now I'm just gonna say you're an addict. Yeah, you need to sort yourself out. I don't care what you're gonna say anymore, because uh, until you, like, don't expect your results to change until you change. That's it. And I kept saying it to him. And I kept saying it was almost to a point where it's like literally, I was like, you're an addict. Stop talking yeah. to me. <laughs> yeah, right. And then um, I think it made him realize though, and he did this little like monk mode thing mm-hmm. where he even like went to the extent that I did when I quit, which was like shave the yeah, head and yep. really go in. I didn't go to gym and everything. And then he started to get results. And he was really feeling really good. And he sent me a message. It was, when I say results, not like instantly. We're talking about six to eight weeks later. Yeah. Um, and he stuck to it. And then now, he, I think he's slipped up, mm-hmm. right? And went back again. And then the results probably went back again as well. So it was like an interesting case study. Because I think, again, he was someone who's young, who hasn't made it yet. Mm-hmm. Who is smoking weed on a very consistent basis. Not celebrating anything. Not See how you did it after... The work's done. Yes. Yeah. Right? He's, he's doing it with no work's been done. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and so many people are like that. That's where I think the issue really is. It's like they're not doing the work. That, that was, that was what, when I was doing it and mm-hmm. I was drinking as well. It was like, and, and that's what I kind of helped me get out of it was that I was realizing, what are we celebrating? Right. You know? Like, why are we going to the club? Whose birthday is it? Or who, who's made some money? Or who's who's got a promotion or something? Like, we're just going for the sake of going. Yeah. This is terrible. And I don't even go clubbing. That was like a little period I was in. Even with the smoking, there's like, why am I smoking? Right? What am I, What have I done today? Obviously, I'm still productive. I went to the gym. But like, what did I? What have I achieved mm-hmm. to deserve this? The, to be able to relax or tone down or detach, right? Mm-hmm. I need to, right now, I need to you know, be attached to make something first. So that's where I think the, the bridge is you know, I, with people. I think it's really well said. And I think that... I kind of am in a, u- a unique case study because I have that experience from like 14 years old of like mm. getting the A's in order to do it. So mm. I think like that might be one of the reasons why, because there, there aren't many successful traders who still smoke on a regular basis. It's mm. more of a niche. I think for those who are out there that are, mm. it's probably because you have some sort of experience like I had when I was younger yeah. where I tied those two things together, right? Like I tied, exactly, yeah. subconsciously I made those connections. So now it's the still, it's the still my brain still works the same way. Mm. If I work hard and if I'm doing everything to the best of my ability then if it, then that's not something that is negative to me right mm-hmm. but i think for most people out there they're still trying to get where they want to achieve yeah. so that does end up setting them back right definitely. i would definitely agree with that that's very well said no, i appreciate it i try <laughs> yeah, no, you i've been it, preparing bro. for this moment <laughs> <laughs> but um going on to the trading side of things then like go, talking about data yes you know? So obviously Umar Ashraf, he has a trade zeller, for yes. example. I'm not sure. Is that something you've ever used? Or? Oh, yeah. 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 So I was a big trade zeller user in uh, early 2022. Mm. I'm not going to lie. Before trade zeller, I, I'm an old dog. Mm. I don't love new tricks. And so trade zeller is hands down the best uh, that I've ever seen in terms of a journaling platform. Mm. But I still to this day write everything down by hand. After yeah, after I trade, mm-hmm. so I have a little yellow legal notepad. I do it day by day. I write down xxx. I still use Tradezilla, but um, not as much that yellow. There's something about it for me. It's mm. like the same thing with having my morning routine. Right, the back half of that mm-hmm. was the aftermarket routine, which is this yellow piece, yellow notepad, right, mm-hmm. yellow legal paper, mm-hmm. right, and I go through. And I don't. It, it for me now, my strategy and the system that I use, it's. It's not like there's some people who say like I adapt to market conditions and I change. I don't do that. I the the system I use and I I think is honestly probably relatively similar to a lot of the forex systems that are out there. That in the sense of I know it works. I don't need to necessarily like back test and stuff. Mm-hmm. The only time that I would really that I that I use um, Tradezilla to the most, which I think is an incredibly powerful tool for it, is the trade replay. Mm-hmm. That, so there will be times where I still I'll go and upload and I'll relook. But it's pretty rare for me now because I'm at the stage where most of my trades either worked or they failed and I followed my stop, mm. right? And it's like, okay, well, I knew – I don't necessarily need to go in and do a deep analytical dive on that, right? Mm. Um, I will say, though, there was a time – it was like three or four months ago where I was in a rut, and then diving deep into your, my statistics there helped me get out of that, mm. right? Like, it helped me get out of that a little bit. But the journaling and the data part, I think, is something that 
you need to be doing in some way, shape, or form, mm-hmm. right? A thousand percent. It's mm-hmm. a necessary part of being a successful trader is accumulating the data of how you succeed, mm-hmm. right? I think that for me, I had just been doing it so long on that yellow notepad that yep. my brain's like, I want the yellow notepad. Mm-hmm. But if I hadn't built that habit, I think that I would be, I would, I would probably be in, in a, a huge trade, even more of a trade Zella ambassador than I am right now, <laughs> right? Where because there really is no better tool out there that I've seen for journaling. Definitely, no, same. And uh, but it's like you said, it's the essence of data. Yes, know, and that exactly. data collection, and therefore whatever method that is mm-hmm. is important. I think it's interesting with trade Zella because I think and just journaling softwares as a whole is because. A lot of people aren't doing it, yeah. right? Because they find it a tedious task. So then that gives those people who essentially are being lazy, mm-hmm. right? Because they should do it because yes. that is what is demanded. That's a fair time to call people lazy. Yeah. When if you're not journaling your trades, it's fair to say that mm-hmm. that's a lazy app. Yeah, yeah. But then especially now, if you have something like TradeZilla and other services available, like you don't have an excuse now. No excuse. Yep. But the issue is that the, you know people might sign up, but then they might not. Do the actual uh, most important bit is is re- reviewing it, mm-hmm. you know, and use utilizing it. So, like, even when you're doing the the, the notepad, you'll be able to review that. Mm-hmm. You know, go back to our last week on this day. Okay. Oh, here was a little. Uh, then go back. Uh, there's a little pattern. There. There's a connect. Um, because I was similar. I used like a journal. Yeah. You know, like a like a almost like a diary mm-hmm. where I'll collect the information from the trade, but also then what did I do that day? Mm-hmm. And then I I would pick up on oh when you didn't go gym you don't trade as well. Yep. You know, or if you woke up like this, you don't trade as well. Stuff like that as well. So like just any form of collection of data mm-hmm. is necessary in trade. That's what essentially that's all we're trading. We're just trading data points. We're just trading uh, the data on it in terms of like the fear and greed or where we're mm-hmm. priced. Everything is data. Everything in our life is like everything data. Everything in data is data. Yeah. And all we're, everything in our life is data and we're just looking at it like risk to reward. What's yeah. the R to R on this particular set of data that we have, that's right? Yeah. And the R to R on journaling mm-hmm or collecting data is crazy high. Mm-hmm. It takes you a very minimal amount of your time mm-hmm. to record that data. It takes you a little bit more, but still a minimal amount of your time to then go through it and mm-hmm. see what's actionable from it, right? Mm-hmm. But it's a very low risk for a crazy high reward. Definitely. Right? Yeah. No, definitely. And was it something that was uh, pivotal in, in changing into that consistent trader as well? Definitely. I think that the... One of the things I should have mentioned is in that morning routine that I had with the pants and mm-hmm. all that, that breakthrough, another element of that was after market close. For the first time in a while, I recorded all of my trades, mm-hmm. and I started to do that, and I started to go through it on that yellow legal pad, mm-hmm. right? And so that, I would say that that collection of data, what that allowed me to do more so than anything was find the commonalities of what would work, mm-hmm. right? And most commonly, it's really, it sounds simple, and I hate that it sounds generic, but the the, the number one thing that I would find in the discrepancies of profitable day versus not profitable day mm. is following the plan, right? Like it, it's, it really does come down to it. If you think about trading in its most basic elements, you create a trading plan. If that trading plan works, you have a small, medium, or big winner. If yeah. that trading plan fails, you have a small loser. By definition, that is like what we all should be aiming for. The hard part is is actually following your small loser, keeping that stop, right? Mm-hmm. Keeping that on there. But what I found is that going able, going through my data, I was essentially able to say that, okay, my biggest issues are on the day where I get uh, shiny object syndrome, mm-hmm. right? Where I start to, I have a pre-market plan, and then all of a sudden, I abandon that pre-market plan for X, Y, and Z, right? That's one of the things that I hands down struggled with the most. And so now it's almost become to a point where I am like, a dictator when it comes to my morning plan. Mm-hmm. Like if my morning plan doesn't happen, I don't touch it, right? Mm-hmm. So like today, for example, we were trading and there was an opportunity. I was trading on Instagram Live. It was a whole lot of fun, mm-hmm. but there was an opportunity for a trade in uh, in Facebook or Meta, right? Mm-hmm. And my morning plan was one specific thing. I didn't have the second part of the morning plan determined pre-market. As the mark, as we started to open and as that trade started to set up, I started to notice that hey, there's another element, so to speak, of my strategy that like I could it would work here. We're bouncing at a level that I pay attention to, yeah. right? That's a layer area of interest for me as from a level. But pre market, I didn't have that level. I didn't market. My pre market plan was only a trend above the next level above it, mm. and I've remained very patient, very disciplined. In that trade, I ended up watching a solid. It would have been a four to one. It was a solid four to one. I watched right in front of my eyes, go by me, right? Mm -hmm. That part is hard, 
But what I know after time and time again through that data collection is that the more times that I disregard the morning plan Mm -hmm. and take an entry just because I missed one four to one there, the next time that I do that, if I break that plan, what's more likely to happen even if the, the trade fails and I just lose a 1R, no mm-hmm. big deal, 1R loss, what that starts to do is be like, okay, well, I've already broken my trading plan on the day. I might as well do it again. Yeah. Right? Might as well do it. Might as well do it. Oh, there's another thing that could set up? All right, let me take that. Yeah. Next thing you know, you're five trades deep and you look back at your initial morning plan that's trending perfectly and you're like, wait, 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 wait. I'm supposed to be in that. Yeah. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm supposed to be in that, mm-hmm. right? So I think, like you mentioned, and not to go on another tangent, but the, the best part about data collection is and it's the same there's a theme in what we've been talking about today and I love this which is it's this theme of of going about it the right way. We mm-hmm. first talked about asking questions and how to ask questions the right way, mm-hmm. right? We then talked about marijuana different takes on weed and how if you're using it the right way or or for you, right? If that's the right way for your brain mm-hmm. or if it's the right way to not use it for your brain, right? I think it's the same thing with your journaling. Mm-hmm. Not only do you have to be recording the information the right way, which nowadays with Tradezilla and other platforms, but for me an online journal, you're talking online trading journals, you're talking Tradezilla, Tradezilla. right? <laughs> like, for me, yeah, Tradezilla has made it so easy for you to do mm-hmm. the data collection and the recording. Mm-hmm. However, that in and of itself isn't enough. Just like asking a question to your mentor isn't enough. Mm. You actually have to take the data that you're looking at and you have to find themes between it. You mm-hmm. have to find consistencies. You have to find inconsistencies. And until you do that deep dive, right, you're not going to get there, right? And so it's almost... It's one of these like several different areas of trading where I feel like people learn the initial part and then they don't do the deeper dive, right? Like I believe that traders first learn market structure and then for some reason they get a little bit confused by it and then they go try and find a million indicators to replace Mm -hmm. market structure. It's almost the same thing in journaling, right? Where you journal your trades initially – Right. But you every day you journal your trades. You upload to Tradezella every single day. You write a note here, you write a note there, you write a note there, but you see no progress from it. Right. Mm -hmm. And that lack of progress that you're seeing from it, in my eyes, means that you are probably not using the data the right way. You're probably not going deep enough on it. You're probably not studying, okay, what were my successes? What were my problems? What were the themes between my trades that worked? It's all this theme about that. you can, there, you can work for years and years and years. You can ask a million questions. You can track your trades for the longest time. Mm. But if you're not doing it in an efficient, smart way where you're actually taking what you're seeing and then implementing it, mm-hmm. then it's all a waste of time, right? And it's all – it's the kind of thing where people – I know people that it's taken them seven years before they found any consistency in trading. Mm. It's because they were doing the same thing over and over and over again for those seven years. Yeah. They weren't like – and even if they were making tweaks, it wasn't – tweaks on the introspective level that they needed yeah. them to be, mm-hmm. right? And so I think much like with everything we've talked about earlier today, data collection and journaling is great, but if you don't use it the right way, mm-hmm. it's going to be another one of those things that you spend time on that doesn't give you a tangible result. Mm-hmm. No, definitely. Definitely. Because uh, it's just, I believe that a lot of people are just very lazy. Yes. You know, they're just very lazy, unfortunately. And uh, it's always a choice. Mm-hmm. And I think the ones that, as you say, like look, seven years, it might take them, I've met people 10 years. Mm-hmm. And though they would turn up, it's, it's a term that I learned from or take from uh, outwitting the devil in mm-hmm. Napoleon Hill where he talks about drifters, right? People just drift where they're turning up to the charts. You know, they're watching the webinar, they're watching the video. But that's it. They're just, it's, the, it's like turning up for the sake of turning up. Mm-hmm. But they're not actually there. They're just drifting along. And that's like probably the worst place you'd rather be because you'd rather either be out of it or, yep. or just fully in it. Mm-hmm. The drifting's like the middle, and it's so dangerous because I've seen so I've seen hundreds, if not thousands, of traders are just drifting, right? And they're just literally just turning up for the sake of it, and they expect one day they think I don't know if they think that sometimes you know as enough time goes by it just works, mm-hmm. but it's not. It's, it's very intentful. You know, it's every single day with the intention and that consistency um, of of putting in the action that yes. builds up over time. But moving, you mentioned indicators there. So I wanted to ask you in, in regards to your trading, mm-hmm. you know, what sort of style of trading do you utilize or you know, do you have the indicators, no indicators? Yeah. Do you, do you hear about ICT or like SMC on your side of the Not of much. The yeah. <laughs> yeah, so ICT I've heard of a lot recently just because mm. he's been, you know, uh, there's this cult around mm. ICT. I personally have no negative. Uh, my thing is I have nothing negative about anybody who has a trading strategy that works for them. Mm. Right? You have a consistently profitable trading strategy? Hell yeah. Who, who cares what anybody else says about it? Mm-hmm. 
the ICT then kind of seems like a cult from an outside perspective, mm. right? Which like I, I I understand what he's doing, but I also, from my very limited knowledge on and, and research on his system, it seems like a lot of big words. There's a lot of a lot of big words that are designed to feel overcomplicated, mm. right? And then I did a little bit of research on SMC before coming in here because I, I knew that's the system you trade, right? Mm-hmm. Or something there. And from my understanding, it's actually very similar to kind of the structure that I look at where it's very market structure based, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. it's essentially using market structure as your guide mm-hmm. for lower highs, higher lows, higher lows, all that, that's right? right yeah. And that for me is the big basis of how I trade, mm-hmm. right? So the way that I always describe to people is I have three pillars, so to speak, of my system, which is trend analysis, mm-hmm. which I imagine is very similar to SMC, yeah. right? Trend analysis, but that also includes multi-time frame analysis, which mm-hmm. is, for me personally, that's the, been the hardest subject. Like on the, the the program that I have, that's like our 18-hour subject. We have like, oh, wow. yeah, it, it's because it, it's an analyzing trends on different time frames and how they impact each other, like mm. a... a a pullback on the weekly chart requires the daily chart to shift into a downtrend, right? Like there's actual little mm. nuances that have mo- that's way beyond just the top down that people have taught. So that is a huge element for me beyond top down analysis, where mm-hmm. it's rather than you go, oh, the weekly is bearish, but the daily is bullish, all that. It's like, no, I know the weekly is bullish. I know the daily is bearish because in order for that weekly chart to get a pullback, the daily has five daily candles in one week. It's going to need to shift trend in order for the like, – there, there's intricacies about, about mm-hmm. multi-time frame analysis that I think are really important to what I do. Um, so trends, which includes multi-time frame analysis. Levels, that is um, – originally the system derived from Eric Marcus, one of my mentors, mm-hmm. is crazy accurate in the stocks and uh, futures world. And then candle analysis, which I really got from Al Brooks reading price, mm-hmm. price charts bar by bar, right? And his thesis on that book – I mentioned a little bit earlier, but essentially is that you can read a candlestick chart. If you can truly understand what the candles are telling you, they're Mm -hmm. telling you a story. You just have to be able to read it, Mm -hmm. right? And so there's a lot of nuances about breaks over individual candles high and breaks under an individual candles low and what that would do for someone who is long or short in Mm -hmm. that area. How would that impact it? And that's the area where I don't know if it's necessarily made it. I know signal bars and entry bars have definitely in the Mm -hmm. Forex world, but the the way he describes it is something that I think, for at least to my knowledge, hasn't made it out Mm -hmm. over there yet. But for me, it's all a combination of those three things, which is Can I have a level or the opening print, which I use as a level? Can Mm -hmm. I have one of those in the area? Can I be trading with the trend, right? Do I have some sort of trigger that's triggering me into this trade where I know my stop is? Mm -hmm. And are the timeframes aligned with each other, right? If I can have all four of those things, the charts are looking pretty good. Like like, like those four things, the main reason that my win rate isn't higher is I like high arch, high R multiple trades. Mm. But if you have all four of those things lining up, typically speaking, I mean, you're in a good, you're, the chart is in your favor, mm-hmm. right? And so my biggest thing is that I eventually, I started with indicators. I had the 20 EMAs, I had the VWAP, I had RSI, Stochastic, MACD, everything you could name, mm-hmm. right? But what I ultimately, I think a lot of traders go through this. In the beginning, you learn SMC type of stuff or you learn market structure. Probably not SMC, but you mm. learn market structure. Yeah. That's the first thing everybody learns. Mm-hmm. It's higher highs, higher lows. And then for some reason, that di- like we, we it's let, diluted, doesn't it? It's, it's diluted. Like, yeah. We, we don't realize the power of it. We're like, that's simple. High, high, da, 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 yeah. range, cool. And then what's that? Oh, this Fibonacci. Yeah. What is that? These things must make, you know, I think it's because we convince ourselves that trading has to be complex. Yes. We convince ourselves that there's with more data, we get a better picture piece of the or better view of the picture, mm. right? That's what we convince ourselves. And I think it's quite the opposite, mm-hmm. right? I think that so after trial and error with a bunch of different things, right? I ultimately came down and said, okay, these are my three pillars. And if I have these four things, if I have a level as a reference point, if I have I'm trading with the trend, I have some sort of trigger entry bar signal bar, and then I above all else, my time frames align with each other. Mm. If I have all that it's a pretty good chart, right? And like, what else do I need, Mm. right? Anything else just becomes noise and anything else then just starts to get in the way Mm -hmm. of that. So I've mentioned this, I've mentioned my four rules in podcasts before. I've never spelled them out like that before, but it's really just those four. It's Mm. it's as simple as that. If I can find those things, everything else is noise to me, right? And so one thing that I talk about that not many people, I get a lot of negative feedback on is I don't use volume at all. Mm -hmm. I don't, 
I pay attention to like the SPX volume for the day just to make sure that it's not like minuscule and there's no activity that day as a whole. But on an individual chart or trade that I'm in, I don't have the volume bars up. Mm -hmm. I don't pay attention to them. For me, that doesn't, that makes zero impact on my decision, right? And so I think anything outside of those three pillars, levels, trends, and candle analysis, just confuses me more. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm like, I, I'm an old dog who doesn't like new tricks, but I am also a big fan of the KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid. I think if <laughs> you can keep it simple, stupid, more yeah. often than not, mm -hmm. you're going to put yourself in a position to succeed. I think so. And we, we, I like to say a lot, like, less is more. Yes. You know, like, yes. you know, it, it sounds, it's, it kind of goes against what we're taught. Yeah. Of course, especially in society, like we're told, if you want to make more money, mm -hmm. do more hours. Yes. You know, if you want to work up the ladder, put more effort in, mm -hmm. you know, when in trading, I think in the learning process, yes, put more in, yes. you know, put more time in, more effort in. But then when it comes to the trading process, again, when you're learning, yeah, put more in. Yeah. But then once you have your data, you have your system, you have your edge and you need to be disciplined. Now you just do what the plan tells you to do, which is probably less. Yes. You know, you don't need to take five trades in a day, you know, unless it's part of your plan, but highly unlikely, uh, unlikely. you know, um, but yeah, less trades, higher quality trades, you know, as you say. And I think the higher time frame uh, narrative is what I call it, but like the multi time frame analysis, mm -hmm. I think that is uh, a bit that a lot of people sort of push aside. You yes. Know? I think they get too zoomed in on the one minute time frame, these lower time frames, right? And then they just forget the bigger picture. Then they wonder why they're getting stopped out and, and taken out for losses uh, frequently when and, and they they're assuming oh this is such manipulated price action but it's yes. the one minute it's the one right? minute it's the five minutes the lower time frames when in reality if you take first the higher time frame narrative drip it down and then as you say if they align or even if they don't align and you're doing a counter trend play at least you know it's counter -trend, that's exactly you know mm -hmm. and you know that it's a high maybe it's a high probability counter trend play mm -hmm. because of where it's priced etc but a lot of people just kind of push that aside as well. Just like it's kind of like with the structure, simple, because it's like multi time frame anar um, uh, analysis. Sorry, and the higher time frame narrative. It's not overly complex. Mm. The way I do it anyway is, is more simple. Just reading the candle, just looking right. at the candle, seeing what it means in terms of the momentums and right. the story between buyers and sellers. Um, so that's keeping it simple. Uh, looking at obviously the the pullbacks and stuff mm -hmm. that will get a bit more complex. But even then, is it not worth having the story? Right. You know? Because that's what we're doing every day. We're coming to read the story and trying to then essentially predict what we think the story is going to be. So if we are lacking such a, a huge element of the story because we're too zoomed in, I don't know. I don't oh, know. no, I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. I have people who come to me and they are – because the, the way that I trade, I'm, I'm a day trader, but mm -hmm. I, I'm a longer – I, I don't mind being in a trade for six, seven hours, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't mind that at all. I don't mind holding something over one or two nights, right? Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily, if I call that a swing trader, but it's it's one to two days, maybe sometimes more, but mostly intraday type mm -hmm. of trades. I'm not a scalper though, mm -hmm. but I will have students who come to me and they say, hey, you know, I'm the way that I work, I'm, I'm, I'm really a scalper, Jake. I don't want to be holding these things for long times. I want to be a scalper. All this, I'm like, okay, that's I totally get it. That that can't, guess what? Candle analysis is applicable on all time frames, mm. so that's totally fine. Everything you're seeing on a weekly chart is just as applicable from a candle perspective on a one minute chart. That's mm. there. There is nothing. However, it dramatically changes the style of trade that you're going to take. Mm. And being a scalper doesn't necessarily mean that you can disregard the longer time frames. If yeah. you're somebody who's trading intraday scalps on a five minute, one minute time frame. That's great. That does not mean you can disregard the hourly mm. or the daily or the weekly because mm. those are still the ones in control, right? Yeah. So I think that the other thing that was really nice for me and that was really helpful was that you mentioned something about the market, people being like, the market's manipulated. The market's yeah, yeah. manipulated. Yeah, yeah. I have a unique I, I don't think the market I mean, the market's manipulated in some sense of like there's a winner, right? Like somebody's out there who did better than you. Yeah. Somebody's out there who has more money. They moved whatever asset they're trading. There is some sort of manipulation there, but it's not the way that the way that charts work and is that they have, there's three stages. You're either, or two stages, you're either in a trend or you're in a range. Mm. There's no other option. Mm -hmm. It's an uptrend, a downtrend or a range. Mm -hmm. That's literally it. A chart, no matter what asset, Forex, options, futures, it does not matter. This applies to everything. A mm. chart is either in a range or it's in a trend, right? It has no in-between. Mm -hmm. And if we start to understand that charts have to go from one trend to another trend, mm -hmm. and oftentimes that involves a range in between them, but they have to go from uptrend to downtrend. And so in order to do that, 
there's going to be moves that fail. So people mm-hmm. will see all the time like a liquidity sweep, right? Something that's like, oh, it took out all the liquidity at the highs and then it sold off, yeah. right? And it's like, I get that people will be like, oh, that's manipulation. Mm-hmm. They were trapping all the shorts out. And I don't like disagree that like maybe somebody out there was like, haha, like, mm-hmm. you know, like, got him. You know, I don't disagree that with that. But that's not manipulation. What that is is that that's a setup, aka yeah. a break of structure mm-hmm. to the upside that failed, mm-hmm. and then then failures present trades in the opposite direction. People will be like, "Well, you just said market structure was all you needed, right?" I'm like, "Well, yeah, but market structure can fail. Mm-hmm. That's how something goes from a structure, an structural, a structural uptrend to a structural downtrend. Yeah. In order for that to happen, there has to be that moment of failure. Whether mm-hmm. it's a failure of change of structure, whether it's a failure, whatever the case may be, a failure mm-hmm. to go higher. I call them failure to go higher is failure to go lower is failed buy setups, failed sell setups. In order for charts to move, which we know they do, that has to happen. Mm-hmm. Like there, it's there is no. So for me, the this. If there's people out there who feel like the market is manipulated against me, the market is so manipulated mm-hmm. against me, I hate to be that guy, but I want to say I feel like you are manipulated against yourself, right? Yeah, because, yeah, yeah. like, yeah, mm-hmm. like you have some level put this in your head that somebody's out there to get you. Yeah. Somebody's out there to get you. Uh, the market does not care about mm-hmm. you. The, if you think, oh, my gosh, the market screwed me over, took me out here, I don't know who you were talking to. <laughs> the market doesn't care who you are. You, uh, Anybody of us, even us who now have – are trading with a larger amounts of capital today. Market still doesn't care about us. Yeah. The market does not care about the 100k account that I trade with, right? Like they the market does not at all care about that, right? And so the market is not manipulated. There are manipulative traits, but the market is not manipulated for you to lose, mm-hmm. right? You just have to understand and accept that moves will fail mm-hmm. in order for chart structures to change. That's the way chart structures change. Yeah, I know 100% cuz I've seen that sort of debate of like structure doesn't work, mm-hmm. yeah. Um and you know, normally people then refer to like inducements, mm-hmm. which is like a liquidity trap, if you will. And inducement basically just means if you break down the word, that it's uh, convincing you something that convinces you to make some form of action, mm-hmm. right? But then, as you said, it's like you're manipulating yourself. Because I've I've now started to say to people like, uh, we're at a point now where people are inducing themselves mm-hmm. off the bu- off thinking it's an inducement, right? So oh, this is going to be a trap. So I'm not, I'm going to do this and that, and then it's not a trap. And then it, it, you know, <laughs> it works out. And then yeah. it works out, yeah. And then, then they've either taken a loss trying to do the opposite or they've missed out on a trade because they're assuming it's going to be a trap. So they start just inducing themselves with this mentality. And I think anything that creates like a victim mentality, whether it's like, oh, the institutions are doing this or yep. so-and-so is doing that or there's an algorithm or whatever it may be, it's, all it's going to do is create fear, more heightened emotion, yes. more fear, um, maybe even more greed because you might be thinking, okay, um, you know, the market's going to shut down soon. That's a big, like, sort of narrative that's mm-hmm. happening at the moment. Let me try and make as much as possible and you know, size up, and, and it doesn't go well. It's an interesting space. It's a very interesting space, and I think that there's a lot of things that just that you mentioned there just really stuck with me. And the first is the people saying, like, oh, structure doesn't work, mm-hmm. right? Or structure doesn't work, all that. And don't get me wrong, I understand where you're coming from mm-hmm. because I went through a phase before where everyone does. You, that's the first thing everyone learns is mm-hmm. structure. It's literally whatever YouTube course... Whatever course you buy, whatever, anything. This is the first thing you learn. Mm-hmm. You draw that little line and you say higher highs, higher lows, right? But I think what people – the reason people think structure doesn't work ultimately is because they they don't have a full, clear understanding of what it means and how it plays a role in both it working and failing, yeah. right? Like it has to fail. That's what – like you know, in order for it to be successful, it has to fail because if it worked all the time – that would mean that one chart is in a straight up trend the entire time, yeah. right? Like that, that, that's not the way markets move. Like, so I think that there's this almost this level of acceptance of once you, so if you're, here's what I'll say. If you're somebody who has been struggling to use structure in the way that you see all, because I think from a Forex perspective, especially all the big traders that you see out there are structure based traders. It's mm. like in the Forex world, more so in the stock world, I think it's become very clear about lack of indicators, more structure-based. I think in the stock and options world, people are still figuring that out a lot more. Yeah. So one thing that I would say is this, that structure, if you are struggling with understanding how to use it in your trading, read that bar-by-bar book and start mm-hmm. to combine things that you know about structure with things that Al Brooks will tell you about individual candles. There are rules and interpretations that we can have about individual candles that can help us guide what market structure is telling us, right? Mm-hmm. Like a break above a previous candle's high isn't meaningless. That's meaningful. Even just a break above it 
there are expectations of what we should have that should continue to happen next mm. just by breaking above a previous candle's high or a previous candle's low. Like that, that can be a piece of the puzzle for us. And if you can find the way to combine that with structure, then all of a sudden you now know how charts move. You know, okay, we were in an uptrend. We failed this pullback. The failure of this pullback caused us to flip into a downtrend. The failure of this lower low causes. So there's all these different ways where people see like, oh, liquidity traps or something like that. And they cause it. It's like, no, like that's is like that's part of structure. Like that's part of it working, right? Mm -hmm. Like the the in order for it to work, it has to fail. It has to have elements and times where it is wrong. Otherwise, charts would just have a, a direct line up or a direct line down. And that's just mm -hmm. not the way they work. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's interesting how people just don't put that two and two together. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like you would think, well, as soon as you phrase it like that, you're like, oh, wait, that makes total sense. It's literally right? just because of the couple times it didn't work. Yes. You know, it didn't, well, it changed trend. Or it changed trend. Yeah. Exactly. It's how it didn't work. It changed trend. Yeah. Or the a couple times where it may have gone for just a bit more of a deeper, let's say if it was in a downtrend and it, it had a breaker structure to the upside, right? But then all it was doing was actually just getting more of a premium price, price yep. to continue. Mm -hmm. Because then what normally happens is it doesn't do that and then continue and then do it again. It normally yeah. will continue down. Yes. You know? Uh, it's very similar actually to, you know, when people, let's say they, they have a rule, they don't trade Monday. Mm -hmm. and then they saw a trade. It's like the one you mentioned earlier where you saw the one to four trade play out. Yeah. You know, next time they'll take it, you know, because of the one time they saw it happen. Yes. But you know, by looking at the data, you know that the time it happens is actually rare. Yes. Like with the structure thing we're saying, it's rare. But we start to base our decisions on the rare times it didn't work because we probably associated to some loss we took uh, when we tried it in the first time. And um, that was one thing I've noticed in the space. I'm not sure if you've experienced it in your journey or observed it, but I know you talked about it at the beginning, actually. Same with myself in my journey. is that you hold on to baggage. Yeah. You know? And I've seen it where uh, traders may have used a prop firm that didn't pay them out or shut down or they may have got scammed by someone here or paid for bad education there and for years later they're still holding on to baggage Yes, and yet obviously they don't have results because th that baggage is holding them down. Have you observed that as well? Oh, 100% and I think that it, it still plays a role in my own trading to be completely mm. honest with you and I don't think that as much as traders would like to say that it doesn't affect them I think on some level it affects us all mm -hmm. right? I think that so I've seen it in a variety of different ways I have countless students who have because I offer a program, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not shy about that. I offer a program. I've had countless students before that have essentially been very scared to purchase it because they had a bad experience with mm -hmm. another program, and they come into our program, and it's like, holy crap! Like it, this is, this is what a program's supposed to feel like, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, I've seen it on that level, countless times. But I still, the part is, some people, you, it's a natural human assumption to think that okay, I'm gonna go get a mentor, I'm gonna figure it out, and then I'm never gonna go through that again. Mm -hmm. That's what that's. That's what we hope. That's what our brains want to happen. This stuff still happens to me in my trading on a regular basis. Mm. On on and two weeks ago on a trade that I took, I had a position where all week I had been talking, I want to hold this into Friday. I want to hold it into Friday. I think that I can turn I had about a sixty K position size in it and options are very unique in the way that they move. But I, I literally thought that 60K could turn into a seven figure position. I thought that based on the R, which is a crazy R to R, and it was lowish probability from like a chart structure perspective, but I really liked this chart structure and I really thought it could make that move. And on Thursday, right before market closed, I had had a really good day and I was like, I'm not going to make this. I'm, I'm not going to hold this position to Friday. I'm going to be happy with what I've gotten. Mm. No harm, no foul, right? Next day, that position makes its move and is actually end up worth well more than the seven figures that I was hoping to make, right? Wow. Which is hard to stomach, right? Yeah. It's one of those trades that's hard to stomach, but it's one of those things where no matter, this is what I mean, no matter the stage you're at, you are going to have new emotional lows each year because that happened a little over, a little under two weeks ago. Last week, on the last Wednesday that I had traded, I traded that same ticker, hoping to get a similar type of move. And I took a $40,000 loss, which is one of the biggest losses that I've taken all year and in my life as a whole. Mm -hmm. And that, for me, the only reason that I was so gung-ho about that trade and that working was because I, the week before, I had seen it. Yeah. And then a week before that as well, I had seen a different name but the same trade idea play out. Yeah. And in my head, I was like, I'm going to make this work. Mm -hmm. That loss for me is, is the biggest one this year and the biggest, uh, probably the biggest emotional low I've had. Yeah. Because I felt terrible, man. Like, it, and I, you know exactly what you're doing wrong, right? Like, you know, and so I think that 
for me, in order to get b- bounced back from that, I had to take a step back, huge step back for the rest of the day. I haven't detached like that in a while, right? Mm-hmm. That was a big loss, but it's the one kind of thing where, where it, it's, it's, it's never going to go away, at least for me. It, it, it's one of those things where maybe it's because of the bad habits that I had in the beginning stages of my trading career, mm-hmm. but these kinds of things, you're going to go through that no matter the stage that you're at, mm-hmm. right? And the best thing that you can do is figure out methods to control those types of days, right? And control those types of emotions. So one thing that I could have looked back on in hindsight on that particular trade is that I should have avoided that name, that stock that I had traded, which was Snowflake. I should have avoided it for at least like two or three weeks because mm. by trading it again, the next with three or four days after, my brain was automatically going to make, whether I wanted to or not, it was going to make that association, right? Mm. Especially knowing that, uh, the week before, it wasn't that same name, but it was a very similar trade where I was like, I was going to try and catch a 10 to 1 R to R essentially, right? Or like a 15 to 1 R to R, which is crazy. But um, so th- I think that the, the the baggage claim, so to speak, I think I've seen it in so many different ways. I've seen it from students that have hesitations, but even in my own trading, it's that kind of thing where I'm working actively to try and remove that. It's one of the things that I still want to. And I think the best thing that you can do is create a set of, rules or create a set of guidelines for yourself that say, say, hey, if I'm even remotely Mm. in any position where I could put myself on tilt, I'm out. Mm -hmm. And by for me, by trading that name again within three or four days, I should have been out because that put me in a position to go on tilt Mm. right away. And I I and I knew that and I I didn't care. Right. Like I was like, I don't care. I want this. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think the baggage part is something that you're always going to have as a trader, whether as a student or as a as a trader himself or herself. It's now just how can I control it? Mm -hmm. Right. What what are the systems I can put in place to control it? Definitely. And and one thing you mentioned there that was really stuck out to me is that, you know what you're doing wrong. And I've always said that I've always said that I think every trader, I think people in general, but especially traders, I think they all know where they're going wrong. Yes. Right, they all know it. They know exactly what they're doing wrong, but they're just not focusing on it. They're not putting awareness on it, or they're just maybe trying to lie to themselves. That yeah. That's not the case. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was your experience been with that? Oh yeah, a hundred percent. I think that when you're trading, I mean, I don't want to say here's the. He, let me pause and reset. Here's the thing about trading podcasts or learning from trading educators at all. I at least from somebody who used to consume this content, yeah. the number one thing that I wanted to learn was strategy from people. I wanted to learn exactly how do you find entries, how do you find access, all all that. Blah, blah, blah. That part is actually isn't rocket science, mm. right? Like, and I'm sure that in the forex world it's even more clear with the the public guy or like not public but the clear tr- strategies that work. SMC, I even ICT, all this, this stuff works, right? Mm. Like, the strategic portion of it is not rocket science. It definitely is not easy, but mm. once you learn it, it's straightforward, right? Mm. So from there, being able to say that, okay, this is not rock and science. Mm-hmm. I know in theory what I'm supposed to be doing. I know that I have that morning plan that says I'm either going to take a small loss or get a, at least two or three X bigger winner, right? Yeah. If you have that morning plan and you have all that in place, it's still, if you have, a, in theory, you shouldn't have any debates of whether, am I going to get this right or am I going to get this wrong, right? But in... Um, I think that as soon as you, it, it's this human being instinct that we hate being wrong, right? Mm-hmm. Like we hate being wrong. So even when you're in a bad trade and you know it's going wrong, you don't want to admit, it's the admission of being wrong. It's not the loss of the dollars. It's not the loss of whoever, of, of the chart, anything like that. It's that we don't want to be wrong, mm-hmm. right? And so that's a very publicly talked about topic. Mark Douglas has done a great job of covering loss aversion and how to try and avoid loss aversion. One of the things that, that, helped me the most because there's, for me, I needed something concrete. I needed a firm way to say that, hey, I'm in that zone right now. And I'm not talking about the good zone. I'm talking about the zone where I'm about to blow, throw my entire account in one trade, right? Mm. I'm in that zone. I can feel it, right? I can feel it. I know I'm doing something wrong. There is two steps for me or two things that made a big, big difference. As much as it sounds simple, mm. it's these little brain hacks that can flip your perspective. I forget which trading psychology book it was in, but there's one principle that one of these authors talks about called the couch principle, which Mm. is if you are trading, you should trade like there's somebody sitting on a couch right behind you watching your every move that Mm. you do, and you're explaining to them why you're doing what you're doing, Mm. right? 
if you're in a trade where you know it's wrong, which most of our losing trades that we let go beyond our planned R multiple, our planned plan stop, we know it's wrong. Mm-hmm. If there's trade, if you're trading there like somebody who's watching you behind you, right? Then all of the sudden you start to try and change your decision making process a little mm-hmm. bit, right? Now that's a great theory, but I didn't find that to be super actionable because I would just be like, "Don't look," you know. I tell <laughs> I tell them I tell, I tell them don't look, you know. Shut your eyes. Be like, shh. Right, or, or or I'd come to the very real realization that they're not there, right? <laughs> like, so for me, I needed to find something. I needed to turn that idea into mm-hmm. something actionable. That's mm-hmm. the way that my brain works. I need actionable things that I could do. Mm-hmm. So what I do now, and I now do it several times a day, is I will, anytime that I find myself either knowing I'm doing something wrong, on the verge of knowing I'm doing something wrong, or on a straight up tilt, is what I call the stand up and step back. And it sounds really simple. But I will literally stand up from my desk chair, push the desk chair in, put my hands on the back, and start standing while I'm watching those charts. I'll start standing. I'll start watching them, all that. But the process of stepping up, stepping back, or standing up, stepping back, all that, now all of a sudden, I've become the person on the couch, right? Mm -hmm. I've become that person who's behind there. I can now – it sounds so silly. But again, it's these brain hacks of where you associate one thing with another. What I have found is that if I am in a bad – spot where I don't want to be, I'll do the stand up, I'll do the step back. And then next thing you know, I'm usually able to make a pretty clear decision on what I should do, right? And oftentimes that means just closing my position and taking a walk. Sometimes that means that, hey, no, you were just having a couple of self moments of doubt. What you're looking at isn't actually wrong. There you are multiple still in track. You should hold this trade. It'll mm-hmm. come to that conclusion sometimes, right? But it gives you that step of clarity where it's like, okay, not only am I pretending that somebody is watching me from mine, I'm going to stand up for a second and be that person, mm. right? And it's those little things like that. Like it, it, I know it sounds so simple and people out there might be listening and being like, oh, but this is one of the many trading psychology advice pieces that I've heard. If you need to find the little things that stick in your brain yeah. to make you not go on tilt. And mm-hmm. that is one of the things that helps me not be stuck in a baggage trade that I know is wrong mm-hmm. is step, stand up, step back, and wa- and reassess, right? And that little process of doing that makes all the difference. It does. And I've always said, you know, you hear about the holy grail in trading, that yes. there's one thing that's going to make it all work. And something that you just uh, searched on there is I've always reflected on that is just the small, it's the accumulation of small, tiny things. But when accumulated is the holy grail. Yes. That's what makes the change. So it's never just one thing. It's um, But it's also, as you say, finding what, is what are those small things for you? Mm-hmm. Those small things will be different for everyone. They may be in the same sectors as small technical things. Mm-hmm. Okay, but what are those technicals for you? You know, it might it might be an indicator, for example, right? Or it might be, uh, you know, something that you know, something that some people, majority of people, don't even know about. Right, it works for you. Uh, it could be in the fundamental section. It could be in the psychology, right? But it's just the accumulation of these small little things that are personal to you, put together. There's your holy grail. Yep. Whatever that, and it will look. Everyone's holy grail looks unique, right? Everyone's holy grail is going to be a very different thing, mm-hmm. right? And that it's, it's an interesting subject because I think building your holy grail is something that takes time, mm-hmm. right? That's the reality of it. Is that in order for you to build your holy grail of trading, mm-hmm. you are going to need trial and error, mm-hmm. right? I have a couple of mentors that I've mentioned before who I trade a very similar strategy to they to what they do. Their holy grail is still not mine. There mm-hmm. are still things that I have to do in order to make my brain work, mm-hmm. right? Like I said, these bad habits that I've had in the past, in order to combat those, I take extra precautions that some of my mentors would be like, what are you doing that for? Like, you're doing this? That's That, that really works for you? Mm-hmm. Like, my frequency of withdrawals? I'm like, yeah, no. It, like, it really works for me. Like, it really sticks with me. It really... That so I think that whatever the holy grails are, understand that you're going. It's going to take you time to find those. But the other line that I don't know why it just popped into my head and it, it, to tie into this particular thing, in order to find your holy grail, mm-hmm. you are going to need to do what is called trial by fire. And I get this mm-hmm. line from a guy named Trade Like Mike, Mike Spinoza, who's also in Florida, an amazing trader. Um, but one of the things that he said is that literally you have to trade. Like you have to in the beginning, especially. You have to throw yourself into the fire. You mm. have to do it. Like you have to like I see people get caught up sometimes on on perfectionism as a trader, mm. in, especially in the beginning. You need fire. You need to take burns. You need to go through this stuff and eventually 
what's going to happen is that you're going to get struck by fire so many times that your skin is going to become flame resistant. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, when you take a loss, it's not going to be an emotional feeling for you. You've been there, done that. When you take a win, when you have a big win, you are not going to be a bad sport, over cocky, overconfident, all this, because you've, you've felt that before. You have mm -hmm. been through this. You have gone into it. So there's this some, it's this trial by fire line that I love where it's like, if you want to put yourself in a position to figure out what your holy grail is, mm -hmm. you have to experiment. You have to try. And it's going to take losses. It's going to take pain. You're going to hit a new emotional low. If this was easy, then why do 90% mm -hmm. of people fail? Like, mm -hmm. right? Like it, it, that math doesn't add up if it's easy, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that in order to find your holy grail, you shouldn't be afraid to take the risk. I actually think it's more risky for you to not take that risk, right? I think it's more risky for you to not put yourself in the fire. Mm -hmm. No, every single time. Every single time, and that's the whole essence of success is taking risks. Yes, you know, taking. I remember when I I used to watch a uh, it's like a round table with like actors and directors. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen it, and uh, a very common theme when listening to them speak about how they got to where they are is uh, overcoming the fear. Mm -hmm. you know, they would all be fearful before going on stage for their Broadway play, or or before the the camera is rolling or whatever it may be, but they all had fear, right? But the only way they got to where they were was overcoming that fear. Some, A lot of them even say they still have fear to this day, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like with the boxers, like Mike Tyson, he said, I'm scared, I'm petrified when I'm going to the ring, mm -hmm. right? Every single time. When like, he's in the ring, he changes his mindset. So it's like the arena of trading. I've always, I've always um, sort of correlated trading to be similar to like the boxing side or the... Um, or any sort of high performance sport mm -hmm. of the chaos, you know, like F1, for example, I'm not a really big F1 fan, but it's uh, it's very chaotic. It requires focus. It requires calmness in the chaos, right? And that's where I think a lot of people struggle, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're, they're not willing to take risks. They're not willing to try and embrace that chaos, mm -hmm. right? They want to avoid the chaos mm -hmm. and, and trying to avoid it by finding the, probably these shiny objects or the Holy Grail, thinking that's how they'll avoid it. It's, it's, that's probably why they have this uh, very rocky road because they're just constantly in this avoidance rather than, okay, let's accept and learn to deal with and, and, and build ourselves and immerse ourselves in the environment. And because it's like when you, another one's like the sauna. Mm -hmm. It's chaotic when you go in there. You're in there for five minutes the first time, it's super hot, and, and then you get out. Next time you're in there 10 minutes, 15 minutes, the same, the same sauna, same, same temperature, mm -hmm. but you're just building a calmness in that face of chaos. Like, um, the thing with the sauna is the trick is that when you go in there, it's the same temperature from when you started, but for some reason, the last few minutes, it feels like it's turned up. Yep, yep. <laughs> you know I mean? It's like a, a hack in the matrix or something. It's all of a sudden been this super intense. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Um, well, I was going to ask you, actually, I just saw your tattoo on your arm. Oh. To make your own rules. Yes. So what was the... Uh, I, I kind of self explained in one way, but yeah. but um, yeah, what was the... Well, it's like? just funny that you literally, you called that out, which this has a TV show connection. But even as you were last speaking about chaos, there was another TV show connection that popped in my mind mm. is that, which is, um, I'm a huge TV show fan. I love TV. I love well-written TV. Mm. And just one last thing to end on, the chaos note that you pointed, there's this line, Game of Thrones, the late, great middle finger, or, uh, little finger, mm. right? Where chaos is a ladder, yeah. right? And it really is like, that was obviously speaking to something much different, mm. but... It's the same thing. Embracing yourself in that chaos, mm -hmm. right, can put yourself in a position to succeed and to climb the ladder, mm -hmm. right? And so, but in order to do that, you have chaos has to occur. Chaos presents opportunities, mm -hmm. right? The risk that we take to become a trader presents opportunities. So I love that. That line is actually one that I'm trying to figure out. Man. Oh yeah, I'm a big. What did you think to the end of it? Uh, no, not they good. They ruined uh, it. They ruined it. That was my best. That was my favorite show of all time, and then they just it, killed it's the show. up until season four, and even five is really solid too. Up until then, it's the best show of all time in my opinion. Mm. But I, they, I hate shows that deteriorate towards the end. All a lot of good shows out there, first they seasons are it. great, but then they deteriorate. They yeah. try and stretch it. All that I hate shows that deteriorate towards the end, and it left a really sour... Yeah. It did for me. It I really... I never watched it again. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't mind rewatching it, but when I do, I stop at six. I, like, <laughs> six is like, eh, but like seven and eight, I'm just like, I don't I don't really care what happens, right? Like, um, But just going back to this, yes. it's funny because this here, it says, we make our own rules. Mm -hmm. And that is a line from 
what is currently my second favorite television show of all time, Stranger Things. I think Ooh. it has potential to be number one, mm. depending on how the ending. Again, the ending is. <laughs> I don't like deterioration. Yeah. I don't like time travel endings. If they time travel in the end, I'm going to be pissed. But <laughs> um, there's this scene in season three where one of the characters, a girl named Max, goes to Eleven, the main character in the show. Mm-hmm. And, um, Eleven, basically, who's been, you know kind of detained her whole life she goes she asks isn't that against the rules right like Mm. isn't that like like don't we not do that and max one of the girls there responds and she says we make our own rules right and then that's kind of like a turning point in the character development for that particular character i have a very analytical brain i don't Mm. I'm, i'm obsessed with this stuff but then even in season four the later part of the shows it becomes this big theme that the both protagonist and antagonist, both the villain and the main character, mm. both come from this element and sense of people tried to control them. Yeah. And instead, their response was, hell no, we make our own rules, mm-hmm. right? And so I was born with... <laughs> I was born with a lot of learning disabilities. I don't think I was actually born and meant to be successful at anything. I was born with a really bad case of anxiety, which I know doesn't sound like much, but as a kid, that can be very detrimental. Uh, Anxiety, ADHD. Mm -hmm. I was born with a speech impediment. Mm -hmm. I was born with a hearing loss, and I was born dyslexic. So five things right off the bat not putting me in a great position to, to succeed and be where I'm at in life. And in order for me to figure out how to succeed, Mm. I had to learn a very different way than most. So I was able to get the 4.0 that we mentioned and do all that. But in order for me, that took like six extra hours of studying because I had to learn how to read the right way. I had to learn how to do math in these, I had to learn how to do all these things that my brain was literally not structured to do well. Mm. I had to learn how to public speak and I was, had a speech impediment. I had to learn how to listen to other people. I had a hearing loss. Like Mm. I had all of these different things and it made me, it felt like, Earlier on, my my teachers in my younger life Mm -hmm. really held that. I don't think they held that against me, but they held my behavior against me, which was sometimes energetic, chaotic, Mm. which I get, but they really tried to force me in a box. They were like, this is what you need to do. This is what your outcome is going to be. This is how you do it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, my brain's a little different, right? Like, I don't, my brain doesn't work the way your brain works. I need to figure out one way that this can work for me, Mm. right? Like, how does this work for me? So it became. Various methods of studying. I would study a lot different than people would. I would do a lot more memorization things. Like it was just a different way that my brain would mm-hmm. process and study in order to do that. And then as soon as I, you know, get a little bit older, I start to come into my own a little bit more, right? I'm still living this little bit like of an outlier life. Like mm-hmm. I, I, I'm uh, a hard worker who smokes pot, right? Yeah. I'm, you know, like a, a lot of pot, right? Like <laughs> I'm not just like a casual smoker. Like once a week, it's like, Oh no! Every day I'm smoking. Like it's it's so I, I I started to to sort of naturally gravitate to being my own person despite what people had yeah. put on me, and that really led me to when I saw that line that was in that show that was like we make our own. Was that one really stuck with me? And then a season later they had the follow up with it, and I was like, oh man! Like this is like it really just hit home with me that mm-hmm. like above all else, no matter what society tells you you should create your own rules for life. Mm -hmm. Now, there are basic moral codes that you should follow. Don't steal, don't hurt people, these kinds of things. But in terms of creating the boundaries that you follow for success, Mm -hmm. there is no definitive path for that. It's not nine to five, it's not doctor, it's not lawyer, it's not trader. Any of those can be that as long as you're happy with it. Mm -hmm. As long as you are doing what you truly want to do and you are following the rules that you've created, Mm -hmm. right? So for me... By having this here, it's a firm reminder to myself that in any situation that I am in, I want to be making sure that I am being myself. Mm-hmm. I am me. And I think if I had never started social media, I never would have gotten this. And it, it really made that big of a difference for me because having it in social media, like I mentioned earlier, I am who I am now, right? Mm-hmm. Like I am, you can take it or leave it. And I'm very lucky, fortunately, most people that at least on the surface, I get along with, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and uh, it, it works well. But I'm now more myself than I've ever been. It's either, it's like, it's not, I don't want to say it's like, this is who I am, take it or leave it. It's more like, this is who I am. I'd love to hang out. If not, that's cool too, yeah. right? Like, yeah, yeah. I, and um, I think now creating my own rules of where, you know, I, I smoke every day. I'm up at four or 30. I'm kind of breaking these boundaries. It really isn't something that's important to me. Mm. Uh, yeah, it was my first ever one. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. First, I got that. And then on my leg, I got another, I don't know why, but I was like, the, the text lines. I got one that my dad said, which actually kind of stuck with me with something you said earlier, but my dad always used to tell me as a kid, 
don't sweat the small stuff, mm. but remember the little things. And mm. that has always, always helped me. So a, 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 that will literally come into play with my trading where I'll have a day where I'll get annoyed, right? It's one of those days where you get stopped out right before your trade starts to work. And it's like, yeah. that's annoying, you know, right? Yeah. I mean, that's a little thing. That, or that's that's a small stuff. Don't, yeah. don't sweat the small stuff. Mm. That, that's not something to be freaking out about. It's not the end of the world. It's not the end of that, right? But also, remember the little things. Don't sweat the small stuff. The little things that can negatively affect your life, don't sweat them. Don't let them bug you. But the little positive joys that you can have in life, the mm-hmm. little positive like senses of, okay, like, man, that walk home I had today, that was really nice. Like that, that put a that was a positive part of my day. That can really carry you into a positive mindset. The mm-hmm. little so it's an, it's just a perspective thing, right? Where the little things can either be what holds brings you down or they can be what brings you up. Mm-hmm. Right. And if you decide not to let the small things not to sweat them, but to appreciate the little things, it really helps you. And I think that as well carries into my trading, right? A hundred percent. Because like you said, the holy grail is a combination of those mm-hmm. little things. No, definitely. Definitely. And uh I think we get too attached sometimes on the day to day. Yes. You know, the smaller picture rather than the macro. It's just similar to the, the charts, right? Mm-hmm. We look too zoomed in, we it's very easy to get heightened, mm-hmm. you know. Versus when we zoom out, we can see the bigger picture and we actually get a better understanding. Yep. You know. Um, but in terms of uh, rake traits, yes, you know, I saw. Uh, was it RakeCon? Was it? Oh yeah, RakeCon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, tell us about a bit about your community and um, you know how you, you know the motivation behind it, the mindset behind it, and then RakeCon as well. It looked incredible. Oh, you know, it was a terms, blast. Yeah, exactly. Man. Like the the fun and you know there. I've seen. I've done like a couple events before. Mm-hmm. Um, I've tried the conference. You know, mm-hmm. the com- you get the conference, get this the education the, slideshows. Yeah. It's not for me. It's like the energy is just so low because yes. you already, especially if you already teach it already. Mm-hmm. What, what more are you going to do? It's Unless you're hiding new. something. Yeah. To, to, to reserve for that. That makes sense. But I, why would you do that anyway? <laughs> right. Um, but the fun ones, that, that, that's where the relationships are. That's where the energy is at, you know? That's that's where the fun ones are. This was a special event for me. Um, mm. So I had been in the Discord world, the Discord stock options futures world mm. for three or four years, ever since I started, before I created my own, right? Mm-hmm. And so I've now had my own rake trades community for like 18 months. Mm-hmm. Um, but prior to that, I was working as a lead, a lead in not the guy, but one of the top people in several different groups. So I was able to learn, okay, this is what really works well for this guy. This is what really struggles for this guy. This is what really didn't do well for her. This is what really did well for him. So I was able to kind of take that and, and I believe, cherry pick my favorite parts of each to build into my own Mm. community, right? And in the process of doing that, I had to build a team. I had to build a team of people to help me answer questions, Mm -hmm. to help me be active in the community, all that. And there were people I had met throughout the course of my journey that had then, we've developed a good friendship. They have shown they're good traders. They know Mm. my system. You know, we worked together previously in one-on-ones or whatever the case may be. Mm. And I had them as my, like, moderator or team, right? My staff, essentially, right? And they're... Um, but for them, even them, I had not met any of them over the course of the four years. We're all scattered across the United States and Mm -hmm. we were trying to figure out how can we do a meet meet meetup, right? And then in the process of us planning some sort of meetup, the other thought goes through my head. Well, what about all of our mastermind students, which is my program or our monthly members? Like if we're all doing one meetup, we should, we should try and make this a big thing, right? We should try and make this an event. So what we did was for my first ever, it was the first time we ever like recorded a vlog or anything like that. It was my first exploration into that style of content. But the goal of it was to say, okay, I want to, I've seen a lot of traders vlogs before and I don't like the vlogs that are, come shopping with me. I'm going to go buy, I, I don't mind, I get it. I get it, I, I get it, but it's not my, not my thing, right? And so I was like, all right, today, instead of me taking you shopping, I'm going to go to Houston. I'm going to go to Texas. I'm going to have 100 rake trades, mastermind students members come there we're all going to have a great time on my tab and it's going to be great. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's going to be a way for me to give back to this community and a way for me to give back to everyone. And it was only open to our people who had already paid me. Right. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't some sort of sales event where I was hoping to make money. We definitely took a loss in terms of like what we spent and all that, but that wasn't the point. Right. The goal for me of that would say, okay, how can I one meet and show appreciation to the team members that mm-hmm. have helped me build what I've built and build what we've built. Mm-hmm. And two, I'm going to show appreciation to these students and members of mine who have put their trust in me mm-hmm. over the countless other people you could choose from, right? Yeah. So we did a trip to Houston. It was the most insane experience of my life. We had one day dedicated to just my team and I where we 
go-karted. We did laser tag. Mm. We had a huge steak dinner. We stayed at an Airbnb, just us, right? And we... That was the first time we had all met. So mm-hmm. us walking through the door, we're shaking hands, we're meeting each other, like, oh my gosh, we talk every day, all day for four years, yeah. and now we're finally meeting, right? Mm-hmm. So that was special enough in and of itself on that one, the Thursday. And then the Friday and Saturday, what we decided to do was we just rented out two venues mm-hmm. and two bars. And we had yeah. said on Friday and Saturday, we'd said, hey, come by. Have, everyone gets a wristband. That wristband gets you drinks and food for the entire night. And... Come say hi, and let's just talk. Let's not do a presentation about charts. Let's not do that. Because like you said, I wouldn't have anything else to give. There's no secret sauce that I'm hiding behind and be like, oh, only people who come to this can get the rake secret sauce strategy. It's like, no, like I, <laughs> you already have it all, right? You know everything I do. Mm. This is going to be, let's just come and let's get to know each other, right? Yeah. And let's get to know each other. And the real thing is people talk about your network is your net worth, mm. all that kind of thing. I think that especially once you start to scale, like the level that like you and I are at now, mm. our network is for sure our net worth, right? We are for sure building and growing and all these relationships. When you're still in the beginning stages of your trading career, you hear that your network is your network, but it's more kind of like, how am I ever going to get in with these people? Like, mm. how am I ever like, what's I got, this is a, this is unrealistic for me. Yeah. But if you can just be around in person, I'm sure FX Summit was very similar to this for mm-hmm. people who attended, mm-hmm. just be around other people who are trying to get there. Mm-hmm. It pushes you to want to try and get there yeah. more and more yeah. and more. And so not only was I able to have conversations with everybody who came and was able to be, I think I got to, I think every single person was able to have a nice conversation. Where are you at in your trading? What are you hoping for? All that. But really, then they got to spend the rest of the day around all of these other people that we talk all day yeah. and then be like, okay, walking away from this, it's like, man, I want to work harder. Like, this this pushes me to go harder, even though we were out having drinks. We were out having drinks. We were having socializing. People were, a couple people had had way too many, you know? Like, it was a fun time, but it was this still, no matter what it is, it was this, it, just being around that environment pushed us to go harder, right? Mm-hmm. So that, for me, was one of the most special experiences of my life. Mm-hmm. I never thought that, I would be in a position where people would like come to see me, but let alone fly in mm, to yeah. come participate in this. Mm. So we had so the reason we did it in Texas is we had a lot of people who uh, we had a small group out there already, but then it's just central. So literally, we had people fly in from the East Coast, West Coast, all over the United States to be in Central U.S. in Texas, and uh, it was it was a yeah, it was a very special experience, and it just I walked away from that thinking, when's the next one, right? Like, when am I going to do this again? Mm-hmm. And uh, now we're planning on something. This we, I'll have already done it by the time this is released, but I'll we're doing something in a couple of weeks where, or next week, where it's the first time a public one now. Now where it's not oh, just wow. former students, not just mm-hmm. former. I just have one night. We rented a place out. I said, come get a drink with me. Come get it on my tab, and let's just talk and put yourself around. Because even it is, it, it really is that process of being around mm. other people who are going through it. Mm-hmm. It makes you want to go harder. It really does. It does. No, it really does. This. There's a difference with the energy, and I always say to people as well: use whenever I've hosted events, is like use the energy from being here. Yes, you know, don't waste it. Like the, you will go back, you'll be motivated. Mm-hmm. Tomorrow you might feel motivated, but it will, it will fade. It's yeah, just the way it is. You can't be around people all the time either. So, or in that sort of caliber anyway. Right. So therefore, you need to use it, remember it, you know, take it in, but use it every day. Um, because, or at least turn up to more events or find more. Events. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, but the energy is real, honestly. Like with the summit, it was incredible. I didn't really get to do too much walking around myself because yeah. I was just sat there just uh, doing podcasts. But the energy you could still feel in the room, mm-hmm. and uh, even like just generally the people that I've known and conversed with, like you said, yeah. like on Zoom and Discord. Suddenly now you're in person, all of you, and you're, you're uh, you know, speaking back and forth when you can and having these conversations that is different. Uh, in person than online like online you're going to be reluctant to send a four-page essay deeper you know about yeah. a subject versus in person that's a one-minute conversation you know yep um so it's incredible but we are coming towards the end of the podcast now and what we like to do is go on to uh, quick fire questions okay right? yeah absolutely so i'll just okay. think of there's one that's reoccurring mm-hmm. that i do on every podcast and then the the i'll do like maybe two more that's just off the top of my mind. Yeah, yeah. But the first one and the one that's reoccurring is if you could meet anyone from the past or present, uh, famous or not, just to spend time with and learn from, who would it be and why? Oh, man, that's a loaded question. Um, does it have to be a trader or is it just anybody? Any, anyone, anyone. Anybody. Okay. Um, I mean, I still think my answer would be Jesse Livermore. I think mm-hmm. that that is, uh, for those who haven't read Rem- Reminisce of a Stock Operator, mm-hmm. one of the great original traders back in the day who ended up committing suicide because he wasn't happy with mm-hmm. the amount of money. He felt like there was always something more. 
I would love to pick in the mind to to in, go into the mind his mind and be like, okay, because if that if you're if you're doing that well and that doesn't make you happy, mm-hmm. right? Then I gotta I, I I would love to have a conversation. Make okay, what can I do to make my end game happier, right? Mm-hmm. Like I so I think that would be a very interesting person uh, to have a conversation with. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. No, I can understand why. And um, the other one is this might be a little bit difficult just because. It's on the option side, but I don't think so. Um, options and future side. But yeah. if there was to be a charity boxing fight, oh, right? charity boxing fight in the trading space, yeah, uh, and you had to pick one fighter to fight, who would it be? Oh man, this is this is uh, a good question. So charity implies good vibes, positive energy. So I'm definitely going to pick a friend of mine. Um, I would say that uh, Jay Dunn trades. I think he's way Why bigger than me. He's six seven. We're really close friends. He's way bigger than me. I think what I would do is I would make him pick a charity that I liked, and then I'd go in there, I'd get my ass beat, I'd, I would lose, <laughs> but then it would go to my charity, yeah. right? And so it would kind of be hacking the game a little bit. I think I'd reverse it a little bit. You have to win for it to go to your charity. <laughs> no, but that's why I'd trick him into choosing a charity oh, I liked. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So All before right. we get started, I would trick him some sort plant of mind game. Seed, yeah. yeah, plant some seed that's like, man, the last place I'd want it to go is XXX, <laughs> and he'll pick that one. <laughs> then I'll, I'll lose the fight. I know I'm losing a boxing match with whoever <laughs> I go in against. Uh, yeah, that would be fun. Yeah, him and I would have a good time no matter what we do. I feel like it would turn more into a WWE thing <laughs> than a real boxing. Right? Like choke style. No, choke style yeah. on the chop down. Uh, yeah. That's great. No, that's great. And then um, let me give you let me give you two more because there's one that I actually skipped over earlier, which I saw you had a, I think it was a six-figure day, mm-hmm. uh, not longer. I think it was, a YouTube, it was on a YouTube video, yeah. I think. Uh, what was that like? Was that your first six-figure day, or was it you've had one before? It's not my first one. I've had a few of them now. So I've I've had a few. My very first one ever was a hundred k, but it wasn't all realized. It was like eighty realized mm. on the air. So it was a hundred on the day, but I was down twenty going in. Right? Um, it felt pretty surreal. I mean, I I won't lie. There's been I've tried to play it off in the past before, where like I've oh, I think about it in terms of R, which I really try to, right? I really do try and think about everything I do in terms of R, not in terms of dollar value. Mm -hmm. But the six-figure ones, I mean, that hit me a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. I remember, because I, whenever I have a big day, I don't go buy anything, because I think, again, that just, I put myself on tilt as Mm -hmm. the minute I do that. I try and think I have to make it back. So that, the most recent particular one, I ended up uh, taking a walk. And I remember I was... Smoking a joint, taking a walk, and I was just sitting there. I was just thinking, like, this is, it's real now. Like, the real life is, like, this is all, I've been working at this for so long. Like, holy crap, I just hit, like, in a day, Mm. right? Like, in a truly in a day, right? And so, for me, I do my best to try and not not let that get to me too much mentally because one of my biggest biggest things is I like to be a good you have to be a good sport Mm -hmm. you all learn that as a kid like you said trading is like boxing or any sport when you're a boxer and you lose you shouldn't be a poor sport Mm -hmm. you Mm -hmm. shouldn't be like that was rest this is bullshit this is all that blah 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 blah. and when you win you shouldn't be running into the other person's face and be like I'm so much better than you you suck all of that so I try to keep myself as grounded as possible win or loss but the six figure days are are, are pretty special and that's the uh, my goal now is to try and not feel like I'm chasing those mm-hmm. though, because that's what led me into the big ass loss that I took on snow last week. So yeah. I think that it's a surreal feeling, but I almost try and suppress it as much as I can. That mm-hmm. way it doesn't carry over into my future yeah. trading. Well, what do you invest? Do you invest in other things? Yes. Oh yeah. 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 So I'm a big long-term investor um, in mostly just long-term stocks. Mm-hmm. I have a whole very big long-term stock portfolio. That's my favorite investment as of now. The nice part about that is that it, it's liquid, right? Like it's like it's not like my investment in Nvidia a stock that I am a big fan of. It's not like at any point in time I can like it's an illiquid investment like a real estate something yeah, like that. Stock. If I, it's stock, so the only downside to that is that if I want to liquidate, sometimes I have tax penalties by for not holding for a full year that kind of mm. stuff. For me, that's cost of doing business, right? For me, co- taxes and all it's cost of doing business. Mm-hmm. It's part of doing it. And so, yeah, I'm a big long-term stock investor. That'd be my favorite place to replace profits. Incredible. Incredible. And then my final question for you is just, what would be your top three tips to traders out there who are still on the journey, still mm-hmm. struggling, but, you know, the, the tips to progress? Absolutely. I would say 
there's a few different areas to cover. Mm-hmm. First, from a strategic perspective, if you're looking to improve your strategy, mm-hmm. that I cannot speak to enough. That book, Reading Price Charts Bar by Bar, and then the work of printing out charts that you watch each day mm-hmm. and going through and marking them up the same way that author Al Brooks does. From a strategic perspective, I don't think there's any tip out there that is free, that like uh, the information is free too, the resources are free, that will put you in a better position from a strategy perspective. Mm-hmm. So that would be number one. Number two for me would be that realize that no matter what kind of strategy you have, it doesn't mean shit mm-hmm. unless you have good trading psychology and a good front mental framework in place, mm-hmm. right? So if, if, if I know that the reason I do the strategy one first is I know I've been there. I've been a listener on these. I want to hear people's strategies. Mm-hmm. I want that advice first, right? But that would be my first piece of advice. My second piece of advice would be accept the fact that your strategy isn't perfect mm-hmm. and that your psychology is far more important than that, right? And my third piece of advice, as crazy as this would sound, is um, have fun with it. Trading is a job. Mm -hmm. It's my favorite job in the world, but it's a job Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, right? And every single thing that we do with trading is not life or death. And I know that it may, people out there be like, Jake, I'm broke right now. This is life or death for me. This is life or death. Well, Mm -hmm. first of all, if that's your situation, you probably shouldn't be trading, right? Mm -hmm. But understand that you, if you're not in a good enough space overall, right, then trading might feel like life or death, but it never should feel that way. I, I, I have a little bit more fun with it. And as I know that sounds crazy. I want everyone to be serious. I want you to follow your rules. I'm not talking about going wild, but have fun with it in the sense of every day, try and make it a good day, right? Mm-hmm. Try and be positive. Try and like, okay, I got stopped out on my trade. Shit happens, right? Like it, it's part of life. I would say take it a little bit less maybe I don't want to say take it a little bit less seriously, but take yourself a little bit less seriously. Mm. Take trading very seriously. Take everything you do extremely seriously, but take yourself a little less seriously. Understand that this is a journey and that five years down the road, if you really stick with it, if you really stick with it, you're going to look back and be laughing and be like, oh my gosh, you remember that one time I was freaking out mm. over that three pip thing that happened and I was just, I ruined my whole month. Mm. Five years later, you're going to look back and be like, God, that was really funny. Like that was, that was really, like, I look at myself, I was stupid, you know? And so don't take yourself too seriously. I think that's a big yeah. thing that can help you as a trader. I think so. I think so as well. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for flying in as well for, for this podcast. You know, I know we were speaking for a while and it was absolutely incredible. And uh, hopefully we'll do it again soon. Yeah. Hopefully I'm going to try and arrange some roundtables yes. and uh, get those going as well. I would love to participate in those. Absolutely. Definitely. Definitely. And if you are ever in the UK, please oh, do yeah. let me know. I'm coming for a Stranger Things play uh, in the fall. So I'm coming there doing that. So yeah, yeah. so we'll definitely link up we'll during link that up. time. Yeah, 100%. And maybe I can uh, interview you so they can hear you answer some questions instead of being such a great <laughs> interview for a while. Yeah. So that's what people say. Let's see. Well, anytime. Anytime at all. But everyone... The links for Jake will be in the description below. So make sure you check those out. Uh, make sure you like, comment, subscribe as always. And thank you all for your support. But until t- uh, next time, I fucked it up at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Take thank care. you so much for having me. Seriously, this was an incredible experience. Thank you. Thank you.